TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Talk TV News at 10. Good morning, I'm Nadira Tudor. Boris Johnson is under pressure to explain why he didn't act sooner to deal with allegations of sexual misconduct against Chris Pincher. He was suspended as a Tory MP on Friday after resigning as Deputy Chief Whip following claims he drunkenly groped two men in a private members club. The Sunday Times reports that Pincher is also alleged to have made unwanted passes at two Conservative MPs in 2017 and 2018. Former head of the Civil Service, Lord Kerslake, told Times Radio that the Prime Minister must have known about Pincher's past. It's unlikely that they would have been made and not been known by the Prime Minister in one form or another. So he had a reputation, it seems, um, and it does therefore make it uh, even more surprising that he was given the role of Deputy Chief Whip. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister and Chancellor have promised the single biggest tax cut in a decade to help ease the cost of living crisis. Writing jointly in The Sun on Sunday, they outlined planning to spend billions to cushion the blow of inflation by also providing relief for council tax bills, fuel duty and energy costs. Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak say it could save every household £330 per year. And it says the Conservatives' 2019 election pledge to build 40 new hospitals by 2030 faces a review by the government's spending watchdog. Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting asked for an investigation into delays surrounding the programme and warned of taxpayers' money being wasted. A poll for the Sunday Times shows that Scottish voters are split over whether a second independence referendum should be held next year. The panel-based poll shows that 44% opposed Nicola Sturgeon's plan for a vote next October, with 43% in favour. An advisor to Ukrainian President Zelensky has conceded that the city of Lysyshansk could fall as fighting intensifies for Ukraine's last stronghold in the Donbass region. Ukraine denies claims by pro-Russian separatists that the city is already under their control. A charity watchdog is investigating a string of secretive deals between Prince Charles and a controversial Tory peer. According to the Sunday Times, Lord Brownlow spent £1.7 million bailing out the Prince's failed eco-village in Knockroon in Scotland. In 2013, Charles appointed Brownlow as a trustee of the Prince's Foundation, which manages Dumfries House, his 18th century country estate in Scotland. And Transport Secretary Grant Sharp says new airport staff are being security checked in record time, so potentially halving the time they were taking back in March to try and ease travel chaos this summer. One of the reasons behind the staff shortage is said to be the vetting process for new employees. Now time for today's weather. Sponsors Talk TV Weather. This morning, a bright start for many, but an increasing risk of showers as the morning progresses. Some of the showers could be on the heavy side as we head towards lunchtime. Taking a look at the details for midday and across northern Scotland, it will be breezy with a mix of sunshine and showers. Temperatures ranging from 12 to 16 Celsius. The rest of Scotland will also see sunshine and showers, some perhaps heavy. Showers will start to ease across western parts of Northern Ireland, but further east and also across northern England, showers could be heavy. Temperatures just hovering around 16 Celsius. The sunshine and showers theme continues across Wales, the Midlands and East Anglia, some heavy in places, but temperatures in the sun lifting to 17 Celsius. A few showers are also possible for southern England and the Channel Islands. As we move into the evening, showers will tend to clear eastwards, allowing many places to become dry. Trust us to take you there. Times Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather. The Sunday Night Club is your club. I'll take you inside the dressing room, from the terraces to the boardroom, to ask the questions you want answered. There is no membership required for the Sunday Night Club from 7.
And a very good morning to one and all after amazing show by Dr. David Bull. Yes, it's just after 10 o'clock here on Sunday, the 3rd of July. Whatever you're doing, whatever you are seeing, stay with us for the next three hours. We have a massive, huge show. There's so much going on. It is just extraordinary. We may need four hours, not three hours. Because uh, today I've got to be talking, obviously, about Scotland and what I'm calling the withdrawal deal. Because no one's talking about what about the impact on the remaining 62 million citizens of the United Kingdom. I'm also going to be introducing a new section to my show called Climate Sanity. I think that's really important so that we put the other side of so much about what we hear of climate change. We've got to be talking about why the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, has agreed to sell yet more strategic defence assets from the United Kingdom. And of course, this week, a massive, massive week of news for the Met Police put into special measures. Who's going to replace Cressida Dick? What sort of leaders do we want? I'll be talking to a former Met Police officer. And yes, once a month, it is, of course, Talk Gear with Howard Cox. He'll be in later this morning. And then we're also going to be talking about uh, the, the way forward for uh, education with Molly Kingsley and Liz Cole. That in the third hour of my show. So much to discuss. We've got great guests through the show, MPs, experts, Met Police officers, fellows, you name it. But of course, I want your input, your expertise, your knowledge. 0344 499 1000 or tweet us at Talk TV or send us a text. You know the number, 87222, using the word talk, because I want to get those views. I know some of you may be with me, some of you will be against me. Uh, And that is really, really important. My big question to you today, should we negotiate the Scottish withdrawal agreement before any more independence referendums so that we don't fall into the problems of the Brexit vote and the Brexit debate? Or indeed, should there be a second referendum at all? And... The other question that you might want to give me your views on, are you concerned about climate change or not? You know the number. Stay with us. It is, of course, it's Ty's Talk. It's Talk TV. Yes, indeed. And of course, that music signals that it is time. Yes, it is time for my Sunday sermon. And this week, I couldn't resist the opportunity to talk about an amazing and incredible part of the United Kingdom called Scotland. Because the lovely Nicola, she has decided this week that she'd like a referendum on independence for Scotland. And she's actually chosen a date next October the 19th of 2023. And there's all sorts of discussion about whether or not it's right to have a referendum and, and what the Scots may vote. And I'm thinking, well, hang on, folks. There's another 62 million people in the United Kingdom. And we've all been together for a fair while, in fact. Over 300 years. And there's not enough chat about what's the impact on the rest of us of Scotland bailing out. Because let me tell you, that impact would make Brexit look like a walk in the park. It really, really would. Because over 300 years, we've become so intertwined. Every sinew, if you imagine a human body, it's like all the muscles that go everywhere, the sinews, the veins, the vessels, the muscles, the bones going through the body. If you chop off a limb, of that body, it's going to hurt the limb, but it's also, crucially, going to hurt the rest of the body. And that's how we should look at this for the whole issue of Scottish, the Scottish independence. And it seems to me that we should perhaps take a lesson out of those who wanted a second vote after the negotiations of the withdrawal agreement. Do you remember those folks? Uh, the people of the, the the people's vote crowd who said, well, we didn't know what we were voting for, so having negotiated the withdrawal agreement, then let's have another vote, shall we? So surely the lesson to learn from that is let's negotiate the withdrawal agreement of Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom before the vote. And then everyone knows what they're voting for without any doubt whatsoever. Now, 
This is the moment when I'm going to offer to be Michel Bardier. So I'm going to be the Richard Dice of these negotiations. That's my suggestion, but others, you might want to put someone else forward. And I'm envisaging that Nicola will adopt the role of Theresa May in these negotiations. I'm not quite sure who would represent uh, Ollie Robbins or David Davis, but you might have some views on that. And surely we should adopt a very similar strategy to that very, very successfully utilised by Michel Barnier. Because, of course, the first thing he insisted on before anything else was discussed was the size of what he called the divorce payment. Because, yes, in the same way that the UK had apparently agreed for certain items as part of being Team EU, well, actually, the rest of the UK has invested in Scotland because it's part of Team UK. So if Scotland wants to bail out, then actually it owes us some money, folks. Yes, indeed, and quite a lot of money. Do you remember about 14 years ago, the financial crisis? Guess what happened? Two Scottish banks that had been reckless with their lending had to be bailed out by the rest of the UK. Over 50 billion quid was spent. Now, has Scotland got 50 billion quid spare, lose change? I don't think it has. But what it does have is something that actually Nicola in her, what I think is a wrong quest, sort of virtue signalling thrust towards net zero. She doesn't want the oil and gas reserves in the North Sea and the Scottish waters. She didn't want the Cambo oil field to be reopened. So if she doesn't value the oil and gas, then why don't we just do a straight swap and we'll call it quits, folks? We'll have your oil and gas and we'll let you off the 50 billion plus uh, money that we bailed out your Scottish banks. That's a good start. So we can negotiate the divorce payment. And once we've agreed that, then we need to talk about security and military protection. Remembering that the very reason, one of the three reasons that Scotland joined the United Kingdom over 300 years ago was so that we could provide military protection as well as financial stability and free trade. Well, the rest of us, 62 million citizens... We cannot run the risk, in my view, in my contention, we cannot run the risk that a financially weak, militarily challenged Scotland may go cap in hand to someone else for cheap technology, cheap finance, for example, a rogue actor, in my view, like Russia or China. No, no, no. We cannot run that risk. And never before has it been more relevant to ensure that we've got a nuclear deterrent. So I think the second part of the negotiation, having agreed the divorce payment, is that actually we make it crystal clear that all of our military facilities, in particular the nuclear facilities, will stay where they are. And that we can take a 999-year lease on Faz Lane and things like that and ensure that we still maintain that nuclear deterrent. Never before has it been more important. And yet the SNP, they don't want a nuclear deterrent. They think we could do without one. How would that work out against President Putin? Not so well, I think. So that's the issue about nuclear deterrence. So we should provide the military cover for Scotland. Now, then we can move on. Having agreed those issues, which I think are absolutely fundamental, then rather like, as Michel Barnier did, then we can talk about borders and free trade. And I think we could, for example, we could be generous. Let's have zero tariffs on all goods. For example, I think Scotland, 60% of its exports, over 60% comes to the rest of the UK. We don't want to rebuild Hadrian's Wall as a sort of base case, do we? No, no, no. We want to be open and welcoming and inviting for free trade, surely. So why don't we instead adopt, in fact, the solution that the EU's own expert recommended for the border issue between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. I'll remind you, back in 2017, a bloke called Lars Carlson, he wrote a report for the EU called Smart Borders 2, when he said that with any of the proposed solutions, they could use technology in order to resolve the problem. So what I would suggest... And this is the sort of technology that we all see day to day. FedEx, Amazon, DHL, the sort of tracking devices for your parcels that you get delivered this afternoon or tomorrow. That's the sort of technology that we could use. And what would be fascinating about that 
We could use that and we could make a massive success of it. A wonderful, world-leading success of it, to coin a Boris phrase. World-leading success of this border technology, this customs technology. And then we could actually show that the whole debate and angst and concern about the border between the Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland actually was unnecessary and that Lars Carlson was right because the technology could deal with it. So these are, I think, critical elements that we all need to know and debate and discuss and understand in order to inform what may happen when Scotland votes. And then there's the the rather thorny question about freedom of movement, which obviously was quite an important part of the whole Brexit debate. What sort of freedom of movement should we have with uh, people from Scotland? Obviously, we want the brightest, the best, but maybe we'd be concerned if millions of people were trying to escape a sort of SNP-style uh, chaotic scenario. So we just need to understand that, surely. I think this is really important. But once all this negotiation is done, then everyone knows where they stand, there's no uncertainty, then be my guest, vote away. What would your bets be on the results once that sort of deal is clear for all to see? I think it'd be very interesting, very interesting indeed. Give me your thoughts, your views, because here endeth my Sunday sermon. There we are. That was my Sunday sermon on the shape of a potential exit deal, a withdrawal agreement in the event of a Scottish referendum. And coming up after the break, I'm going to be talking to the SNP MP for uh, Dunfermline and West Fife to discuss his thoughts on this absolutely critical issue. Give us a call 0344 499 1000 or, of course, tweet us at Talk TV, text 87222, you know the numbers, I want your views, your thoughts, stay with us, it's the home of common sense, it's Tice Talk, it is of course Talk TV.
Welcome back to Ty's Talk here in the first hour. And yes, my Sunday sermon there on the issue of Scotland and the withdrawal agreement, what that might take, what that might look like, when we should negotiate it. Because, of course, if Scotland were to have another referendum and vote to leave the UK, it impacts not just the Scottish people, but all the remaining 62 million citizens of the UK. And I don't think there's enough focus on that side of the debate. And I think it's really important that that's put, that's understood. As I say, it might make Brexit look like a walk in the park. Uh, and so I'm delighted now to be able to do, uh, discuss this further with uh, Douglas Chapman, who is the SNP MP for Dunfermline and West Fife. And to look at this, Douglas, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining me on Ty's Talk here at Talk TV. Great to have you with us. I don't know if you picked up um, my uh, any part of my Sunday sermon when I was sort of looking at the uh, the issue of the, uh, the a potential referendum. And in a sense, the way I'm sort of questioning it, Douglas, is from the point of view of the other 62 million citizens of the UK and the impact on us and uh, how it might proceed in terms of the timing and the strategy of a withdrawal agreement negotiations. Uh, I mean, do you think that we should learn the lesson from uh, the Brexit uh, process, if I can optimistically call it that, some might call it a saga, but let's call it a process, and say that actually we should, uh, we should negotiate the deal before the vote so that everybody knows what, they, what they're signing up to? Well, uh, good morning, Richard, and uh, thanks for asking me to, to be on the show. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's uh, an awful lot of lessons that uh, we can learn from the Brexit process. And, uh, you know, I, I think when you look back at some of the, the examples we had of, um, like David Davis going to, to Brussels with, a, you know, nothing on the table, whereas the, 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 the EU site had... Uh, you know, a, a whole host of documents and uh, proposals and, and so on. And, you know, the, the, what the UK took to that meeting was, was very, very little. So I think that there's lots of lessons that we can all learn, I think, through that, through that process. Um, but the, 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 the idea of having a referendum is, a, is, absolute, is a, abs, absolutely to uh, give the choice to the Scottish people to decide if they want to become an independent nation. And, you know, the, the focus needs to be that on that initially. Uh, I, I don't think that there'll be a, a second follow-up referendum on the deal, as it were. But the... Uh, so, I, surely, I think... so surely the answer, Douglas, is to negotiate the deal before the referendum and then there's no doubt what people are signing up to. Well, well no, I don't think that that would, that would actually work very well because what you're dealing with is, a, is a, a concept of Scotland being an independent country and putting that to the Scottish people. Uh, it's then up to the government on uh, both sides uh, really to come to an agreement on how that works out in practice. And, uh, but don't you, you know, thought, but, but, but your own um, leader, Nicola Sturgeon, was very keen on having a second Brexit referendum after the, the deal was negotiated, so people could be sure. See, you can't have it both ways, Douglas. No, but we, well, if I remember correctly, that didn't actually happen. Uh, we didn't get a say. We didn't get a say. No, but you uh, asked for one. But now you're saying you shouldn't have one. Well, no. no I, well, obviously the the British government are not open to uh, having that kind of thing put on the table. So you know, I think uh, the, the if we had had a uh, a follow up referendum, you know, sixty two percent of people in Scotland didn't want Brexit uh, to start with, and uh, when we were asked or when we asked. Uh, the British government, you know, can we can we be part of the the negotiations? Can we can ha can we have our say in, in how the negotiations pan out? Then all these requests were rejected. But, but so that, that does make it right. But uh, I agree with you there. But the, the 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 whole issue should be that in the first instance we need to get sign up to, from the Scottish people to say, do you want to be an independent country? Do you want to live in an independent country? It would be Scotland. Uh, or not, and or, or you so, want to remain part of the union, and I think that I think we need to cross that bridge first. And I think Willie White Law often said that uh, you know it is uh, that that you know you, you cross one bridge at a time, and uh, that's where we are. I think with the, the yeah, referendum, my my sense is that uh, even if the vote was to cross that bridge, I suspect people will be clamouring to come back across. 
when they see the nature of what a, uh, a withdrawal agreement may look like. But do you accept, Douglas, oh. that there's a massive impact on the remaining 62 million odd citizens of the UK? I mean, we've been, we've been loving friends and family for 300 years. I don't think that changes one, one iota. I mean, I, I've got friends and relatives all over England, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, and many in France and, and Italy. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't think of them as living in uh, a, another country with borders. They're, they're still family and friends. Um, but what, where we, we can make a, a difference in Scotland is by making our own economic decisions in the future and de you know, developing, developing our economy in a way that actually suits the needs of the, 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 the Scottish environment. Uh, and that's something that we're not getting at the moment from uh, either the London government uh, that exists at the moment and indeed past governments. Uh, they've not respected the views of the Scottish people and I think that the, uh, that lies at the heart of the reason why we no. need to be an independent country. No. I mean, one of the impacts on the remainder of the 62 million that I touched on yeah. is the issue of, of military protection, <laughs> deterrence, nuclear deterrence, and as I understand it, unless it's, it's changed, I missed it, uh, the SNP policy is uh, that you're not pro-nuclear as a deterrent, uh, but surely uh, the, the current tragic events in Ukraine, uh, seeing what President Putin is doing, has highlighted the vital importance of a strategic nuclear deterrence in order to uh, to be exactly that a deterrent if we didn't have that if we adopt uh, the smp approach then we might be looking rather weak in the eyes of uh, president putin well I, I don't think you've missed anything in terms of the smp policy i think that, that that is absolutely a firm commitment that we would not have nuclear weapons in scottish soil so uh, but in a more general term in terms of the the defence of uh, Scotland and uh, you know around these islands as well. We would be seeking NATO membership, and uh, you know we would be part of the other group of countries. So, so you so you want the rest of NATO to provide you with a nuclear deterrent, but you don't want it on your own soil. That doesn't seem very no, fair to me, Douglas. Uh, well, no, Richard. What I'm saying is that Scotland would make a valuable and significant contribution to NATO in terms of the defence of so the. So the our, our own waters, but in terms of uh, and, and land mass, but we also we'd also be partners within the NATO alliance, so that uh, you know we could put our shoulder to the wheel when it was required. The issue of of nuclear weapons is is long standing in Scotland, uh, uh, and you know I think the, the I think it would take an awful lot for to, you know public opinion to to change on that matter. Yeah, uh, but we we feel that, that you know. More, well, nearly all of the nuclear weapons uh, that the um, under the Royal Navy uh, actually sit on the Clyde. So, well, that's right. What I, what I would propose is, is a nine hundred and ninety nine year lease, so yeah, that we, we, that yeah. that way, in a sense, it's not on Scottish soil, but um, but yeah. we've got the well, comfort of it. But what, I, what I'm trying to say to you is that we f we feel we're very much a target rather than. You know something that is uh, is of value, and uh, I think that's the real danger uh, in terms of trying to change. Just, just finally, before we go, Douglas, I actually think there's a, an opportunity for us jointly to be world leaders on customs technology, using sort of tracking type uh, devices for goods that cross the border. Would you agree with me on that in terms of goods? Uh, uh, absolutely. I, I, I think. I mean, I've, I've been using the phrase that. Uh, I mean, there will be some sort of border between Scotland and England post-independence, uh, but I think that should be a border to boost trade. Yes, um, indeed. You know, Douglas, I've, I've got to run to the news, but that's a great moment of uh, agreement to finish on. Douglas, thank you so much for that. You're listening to Ty's Talk. It's Talk TV. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and this is Talk TV. I think my most memorable and proudest moment in journalism of all these years is actually being on air during the lockdowns, uh, even when I had COVID myself. Over the last two years, getting people to tell their stories, not just about people who lost loved ones to COVID, but people who lost their fundamental freedoms, their children's schooling, their mental health, their physical health, their businesses, and giving people a chance to tell their stories about how it affected them. is Talk TV News.
Good morning. I'm Nadira Tudor. Boris Johnson is under pressure to explain why he didn't act sooner to deal with allegations of sexual misconduct against Chris Pincher. He was suspended as a Tory MP on Friday after resigning as Deputy Chief Whip, following claims he drunkenly groped two men in a private members' club. The Sunday Times reports that Pincher is also alleged to have made unwanted passes at two Conservative MPs in 2017 and 2018. Former head of the civil service, Lord Kerslake, told Times Radio that the Prime Minister must have known about Pincher's past. It's unlikely that they would have been made and not been known by the Prime Minister in one form or another. So he had a reputation, it seems, um, and it does therefore make it uh, even more surprising that he was given the role of Deputy Chief Whip. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister and Chancellor have promised the single biggest tax cut in a decade to help ease the cost of living crisis. Writing jointly in The Sun on Sunday, they outlined planning to spend billions to cushion the blow of inflation by also providing relief for council tax bills, fuel duty and energy costs. Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak say it could save every household £330 per year. It's as the Conservatives' 2019 election pledge to build 40 new hospitals by 2030 faces a review by the government's spending watchdog, Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting, asked for an investigation into delays surrounding the programme and warned of taxpayers' money being wasted. And a poll for the Sunday Times shows the Scottish voters are split over whether a second independence referendum should be held next year and how they would vote. The panel-based poll shows that 44% oppose Nicola Sturgeon plan for a vote next October with 43% in favour, 48% said they would vote for independence, 47% said they wouldn't. That's all for now. We'll have more in half an hour. And a very good morning and welcome back to Ties Talk. Well, the Twitter has absolutely exploded with thoughts and views about Scottish independence and my interview then with uh, Douglas Chapman. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, one says, uh, Richard, I put it to you that your Sunday chairman should be available throughout all social, serv uh, social media platforms. Every thought a gem. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. Uh, one here, Les, says, I don't think your Sunday sermon would have gone down well with the, uh, the nationalist faithful uh, in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, they might need to have a daily, daily silent collection to keep the doors open. There we go. Uh, another's, uh, another here from, which is a text message, I'm fed up of hearing about Scottish independence. I've recently left Scotland and moved to Portugal as Scotland's fast becoming a failed state. That's interesting. So, gone to Portugal, Portugal not the rest of the UK. Fascinating. I'll get back to more of those uh, loads and loads of uh, thoughts and questions. I have to say, I don't think that the MP Douglas Chairman, I don't think he answered that key point about the nuclear deterrence properly, and it seems to me he just wants to ride on NATO's coattails. Uh, thanks very much. Well, there's a price to that. And I don't think he really satisfactorily did with the strategic point of when to negotiate the withdrawal agreement. But anyway, let's see what Philip in London thinks. Good morning, Philip. Oh, good morning, Richard. And uh, I really enjoyed the Sunday sermon. It was, uh, it was enlightening. I... I um, I was talking to a good friend of mine. I've known him many, many years. He's a very successful commodities trader. He's based in the Americas now, and he gave me three reasons, economic reasons, that have never been addressed honestly by the SNP as the consequences of an independent Scotland. And I'll just give you a quick overview. The first is fundamental one. What currency will replace the pound sterling? Indeed. The, the second question that they never answer honestly is how will they make up for the deficit when the subsidies, I believe it's the Barnet form, which is very complicated, roughly 14 billion, he believes it's worth. Yeah, per, most, per head, they get about, I think the Barnet formula gives them about 30% more than the rest of the UK. And free education and prescriptions and such like. But the most interesting one I found uh, is he said that uh, there'd be a massive capital flight from Scotland. And he said the whole economy would collapse in very quick order. And he gave me an example. I just checked it now. Uh, a very clever lady by the name of Alison Rose is the chief executive of that West 
which is the holding company of the Royal Bank of Scotland. She has stated on the record that an independent Scotland would not have an economy robust or large enough to handle the loan book of the Royal Bank of Scotland. And as a consequence, they will remove their entire, sorry, move their entire banking operations from Edinburgh to London in quick succession. Uh, these, are, these are never fundamentally uh, answered by well, any degree that, of honesty. That's absolutely right, Philip, and that's why I think you've got to have that discussion, that de uh, debate and that negotiation before the vote, because essentially we've already uh, absorbed the balance sheet of the, the Royal Bank of Scotland when it was effectively yes. renationalised in order to, right. uh, to prop it up. And the cost for that was, was tens and tens of billions of pounds. I think Royal Bank of Scotland alone was over £40 billion at one point. If I remember rightly, Richard, they had to split it into two halves, the good banking and the bad banking, because NatWest and the other big four at the time did not want to touch it because of that's, all the toxic That's right. And, and it's fair to say, Philip, there was a lot more of the bad than there was of the good. <laughs> oh, it was huge. It was shifted onto the, uh, to the taxpayer. Absolutely and, right. And uh, it's, as I said, uh, it's Miss Alison Rose... Um, she's got on the record. Yes, yeah, she and, has. Yeah. No, I remember. I mean, you're so right. I didn't even touch on the currency point. Uh, in, a, in a funny sort of way, I actually think some of the other issues are bigger and more strategic. But, I mean, obviously the yeah. currency point is also very well, important you, you indeed. Hit on a very good, you hit on a very good point. So independent Scotland is looking to latch on to NATO or someone to pick up the tab. Um, another good point that he mentioned, this is just ancillary, I know you're very busy, he said if, if an independent Scotland thinks it's going to be allowed to join the EU, they can think again, and I didn't understand what he meant, and he explained something very clearly and concisely. He said in Europe there are independent movements that are just simmering under the surface, particularly in France, would you believe, Spain, That's right. and to a less degree Belgium. If an independent Scotland were allowed to join it would, the EU, that would undermine the structure by reigniting... Completely. It would, it would take them many, many years. Philip, I'm just going to um, thank you so much for your thoughts there. That was Philip with his concerns about some of the key issues. I'm going to head up from London to Manchester, where Richard is patiently on the line. Morning, Richard. Oh, good morning, sir. Thank you for having me on your radio show. Great pleasure. Uh, What's on your mind? I watched um, The Future of Britain... Um, which was portrayed by Blair as the worst state that Britain has been in since 1945. And he went on and on and on with all these sycophantic audience. Um, and he portrayed this, uh, uh, the whole world is in big trouble. And in his usual messianic style, um, he put it that he's the man to sort all this lot out. I think you know, and I think if we're very honest, and a lot of people listening to you, and a lot of people listening to this radio show will know that him and Alastair Campbell, and I say it without fear or favour, because I've been watching this for a long time, have the control over Nicola Sturgeon. And if she can actually... Uh, get the Indie Ref 2 and successfully do it, and I've listened to all your arguments today and a brilliant sermon on it and what your past uh, caller said. If they can do that, it will give them the wedge to force England back into the EU and they would get their 16 billion a year, uh, uh, a year again. It's, it's well, interesting, Philip. Is... No, it's, uh, someone else has mentioned this, uh, I, I've heard in the last 24 hours, about Blair essentially trying to come back through Scotland. I, I, I'm, I'm maybe being a bit slow following that logic, but, but you're on that page as well. Well, definitely. This has been going on since day one of the Brexit uh, of us 17.4 million people, which you contributed to, and, and the great man contributed to, Nigel Farage, whatever you think of him, he did this country the biggest favour that we've had done to us for a long, long time. Absolutely right. And you know better than I do what is going on in this country to get us back in. All the sycophantic people who, the Blairites, who absolutely love this great man, you don't have to go too far back in history to prove he ain't a great man when he's involved with with Bush, uh, Clinton and everybody else. And they are against the world. And the guy Schwab, um, who was at Davos, actually came out with a statement which I was astounded. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, look, I think that um, Blair does think that he is uh, the best of the best. I, I sort of don't really follow the conspiracy theory, but... 
uh, it's an interesting point as to whether uh, actually the likes of Blair and Campbell, in a sense that they're trying to work with Sturgeon. I'm not 100% convinced about that, Richard, but it's an interesting theory. Thank you so much for that. That was Richard, uh, Richard from Manchester. Interesting thoughts. Do you agree with that? Whether or not actually uh, the likes of Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell, are they sort of trying to come in almost like the, through the back door uh, through Scotland in some way to to sort of engineer us to get back into the EU. We need to remain very, very vigilant about that. I certainly do agree. Lots of tweets and messages coming in. One here from Pete. Most people don't realise how much of the, our defence industry is currently in Scotland. Not just military facilities, but shipbuilding, test centres uh, and a big firing range, m manufacturing facilities. They couldn't all be relocated south. Pete, you're quite right. Stay with us. Lots to come. It's Ty's Talk. It's Talk TV. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. We've been talking about what a withdrawal agreement should look like if there was to be a Scottish referendum and indeed when we should have that negotiation. I've offered to be the UK's equivalent of Michel Barnier and lots of, lots of tweets coming in. Uh, some very funny ones, uh, I must say. Uh, one here from Cooperman who says, I've no issue with Scotland being independent. Uh, if it happens, we must have a very hard border with a proper wall and rigorous passport checks. Interesting. Uh, here's another one, uh, which was from Jules, who says, Sorry, did I miss the bit where Dougie outlined uh, how they're going to fund their independence? That's a good point as well. And one here, uh, which is from Link, the Lynx Poacher, who says, 
Uh, where's it gone? Uh, he said, basically, uh, I said that it was like um, chopping a limb off if Scotland was to leave. Uh, Link said it'd be more like lancing a boil. Uh, lots and lots of uh, thoughts and messages there. I think people really uh, concerned about whether or not they'd be able to survive financially on their own. And this is the thing, this is my real concern, is that they might think they can, but their biggest source of wealth is oil and gas, and they don't want it because they want to rush towards, in my view, foolishly, net zero faster than anybody. But that's their biggest asset, oil and gas, fossil fuels that provide cheap energy. Well, used to when we used our own oil and gas as opposed to importing lots of it. Anyway, so lots to talk about there. Keep those thoughts and uh, tweets, messages coming in and calls coming in. But meanwhile, there's another massive issue that is facing us all, really, because... This week it was announced that the Metropolitan Police, currently leaderless and I would suggest rudderless, is in special measures. That's the equivalent of being in serious, serious detention. But then it transpires, it's not only the Met Police, but we've got Greater Manchester Police and I think at least another four forces in uh, special measures. So this is a large chunk of the UK's police forces that are essentially so underperforming that they're in special measures, the equivalent of detention. I mean, you know, it's like the lowest mark possible. It's essentially saying, you can't run your own force, we're going to bring in outside leadership. Well, I'm delighted to be joined now to discuss this further by a former uh, Met Chief Inspector who worked in the Met for some 12 years, Michael Pastor. Michael, a very good morning to you. Uh, we've... Um, uh, we've sort of talked some while ago about the Met Police. Uh, that was before Cressida Dick had essentially been forced out by the Mayor, Sadiq Khan, and before special measures. I mean, how serious is this in your view? Yeah, good morning, Richard. Thanks for, uh, for having me on. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that these special measures have been implemented post-resignation uh, of uh, Cressida Dick. And, and one does wonder if indeed she was informed that there was uh, a plan to place the Metropolitan Police under special measures uh, and that it would be in her best interest to uh, move on from her role before this was rolled out. Um, I think what's also worth remembering, Richard, is that there's over 30 chief police officers in the Metropolitan Police Service, uh, each earning a, a minimum of, of just under £100,000 a year. Uh, and one does wonder if indeed accountability should now be placed on their shoulders uh, for consideration uh, and, and sort of a case to answer around but I guess why I, indeed. I guess the question is there, Michael, about, well, you know, it's not just Cressida Dick who is leading it. If you've got mm. those 30 people as you just mentioned i mean they've all got to bear that accountability that responsibility for being in special measures so uh, in a sense i'm not suggesting we get rid of them but uh does that mean that actually it needs a a complete fresh face not only from outside the met but actually possibly from outside the police to come in and shake it up uh, frankly give everyone a good slap around the face and and, and sort it all out mm. Well, I think there's there's a number of options uh, that the Metropolitan Police could look at in relation to who is next appointed commissioner. I think it's absolutely imperative that whoever succeeds uh, Cresta Dick does have the respect of frontline police officers. That is that is vital. Now, it could indeed come from outside uh, of the police service. We could look at other uniform discipline services, inclusive of the, the armed forces. Um, we could also consider options um, abroad. Uh, for example, um, the former commissioner of the uh, New Zealand police has applied for the role and is one of six um, options being considered um, to take on the role of Met Commissioner. So, and I would very much support that. I actually think the last people that it should be is someone from within the Met. I think the situation is so serious. And if multiple forces across the UK with people sort of from within are failing, uh, then, yeah, either ex-military or someone from overseas. You think there's a shortlist of six still? I, I read over the weekend that it was down to a shortlist of two. 
Yes, that could well, that could well be possible, but I, I'm also aware that they are still accepting um, applications uh, for this role. So clearly they've completed an initial shortlist. Um, however, those that are eligible to apply can still do so, Richard. Right, OK. Well, um, and do we know who those six are? I mean, essentially it sounds like they almost reopened the, uh, reopened the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if, if, if there are alternative um, applications, it is more than likely to have come from Home Office County Forces. Um, so to be eligible uh, to apply for the role, you need to have been uh, a Chief Constable of a Home, a home County Force or um, the equivalent of a Deputy Assistant Commissioner in the Metropolitan um, Police. Um, I do know that a strong candidate from the National Crime Agency um, has subsequently withdrawn from the process, uh, which is quite unfortunate because I'm aware that that individual did have a good track record. Um, but no, applications are still open for uh, consideration. Right, and essentially, I think now that it's in special measures, I think the thing has actually sort of shifted. The, the, the gravity and the seriousness of it has shifted. What, uh, what, Michael, do you think are the key sort of three priorities for new leadership of the Met, and actually maybe that applies to the other five forces as well. Yeah, I, I think you can sort of strip this down, really, from, from a national perspective around what are the key um, incentives and initiatives that uh, a future police leader needs, needs to look at. Firstly, certainly within London, uh, restoring confidence of the, uh, the London public, that is paramount. Um, I think it's down to sort of 54% now. We've seen a gradual decrease in the confidence level over the past five to six years. I think also ensuring that resources and money is being targeted and deployed to frontline policing, um, reducing crime and the causes of crime, and also improving the detection rate uh, is absolutely imperative, Richard. It's, it's quite concerning that nearly 70,000 crimes are going unrecorded in London um, at the moment. 70,000 um, unrecorded? Unrecorded crimes, yeah. So, for example, it would have been a case that police officers would have attended or indeed not attended a call uh, and determined that um, a crime had not been committed. Yeah, indeed. I mean, that's just, just absolutely huge. And the charge mm. rate now, I think nationally, is down at about 6 or 7%. And I yeah. think that is similar in the Met, which is obviously the, the largest force. Mm. I, I mean, can you recall, what was the charge rate when, when you were an officer? Yeah, it was more sort of around the 23 to 25% wow. um, level. Um, wow. But I think it's also worth remembering that um, for the bulk of uh, offences, and particularly uh, the more serious offences, the decision to charge uh, does lie with the Crown Prosecution Service as opposed to um, the police itself. So I think greater coordination and joint-up working between the police and the Crown Prosecution Service is absolutely imperative going forward if we're to increase that detection rate. Interesting. And in terms of uh, getting more more police officers on the streets rather than behind a desk or in a car. Why is it so difficult to achieve that? I think first and foremost, uh, one of the key issues for frontline police officers is the amount of, uh, of admin and bureaucracy that they're tied up with. I mean, just a, a, what I'd call a, a simple prosecution file that would go to the Crown Prosecution Service can take hours um, to complete. So, you know, an officer can attend an incident, uh, have someone under arrest and in custody within 30 minutes, but still find themselves behind a desk three hours later completing paperwork. It should not be the role of a frontline response officer or a neighbourhood police officer to be stuck behind a desk uh, writing, you know, reams and reams of information. You know, it should be a case, get the offender in custody, basic statement, back out on the beat uh, it, exactly and i'm sure it was like that and and technology you know using smart technology so you can do much of that in a sense whilst you're out on the beat yes yeah so for example things like stop and search um paperwork can be produced for our mobile devices uh, there and then um and yeah you're absolutely right you know these things can be conducted whilst officers are deployed as opposed to um back at the office so to speak yeah, perfect. Michael, thank you so much for those thoughts on uh, the new leadership for the Met. What are the key priorities? That was Michael Pastor, who was 12 years in the Met, rose up to being Chief Inspector.
Uh, that's absolutely fascinating. Give us a call, your thoughts, your views. I've got lots of other thoughts that are pouring in on Twitter. Gary's a bit upset with me. Oh, dear. When I said a good slap round the face, obviously I wasn't actually meaning that. I was talking about, you know, sort of metaphorically, but Gary has got um, a little bit upset about that, uh, just to clarify that. Uh, and what have we got here? Uh, We've got one here from Kelt who says, I don't agree with the nuclear deterrent staying in an independent Scotland, which would be a foreign power, bring it south of the border, along with the shipbuilding jobs. Uh, the other issue, they owe us more than 50 billion. Yes, I appreciate that. The reality is that the cost of moving that nuclear deterrent would be tens and tens of billions and take an unbelievable amount of time, many, many years. My point is, you don't need to do that if you agree all this stuff up front. And that's one of the red lines. There's no need to spend that money. It's a key red line. Leave it where it is. That is my thought on that. Uh, what's here? We've had another message from Noel who says, I'd like a vote on English independence. We pay subsidies from Westminster to Scotland to Wales to Northern Ireland. Uh, but the English have no direct representation. Uh, English students end up paying with uh, more student debt. It's, I mean, it's a fair point, but obviously England is... Uh, essentially, it's the largest country within the Union. Lots and lots of messages keep coming in. We'll get to uh, climate change shortly because my next guest is, uh, Joach is uh, yes, Joachim Book, the author and research fellow. And we're going to be talking about climate change and sea level rises. Stay with us. Don't go anywhere. It's Ty's Talk. It is, of course, Talk TV. <laughs> is Talk TV. 
Talk TV News at 11. Good morning, I'm Nadira Tudor. Ross Johnson is under pressure to explain why he didn't act sooner to deal with allegations of sexual misconduct against Chris Pincher. He was suspended as a Tory MP on Friday after resigning as Deputy Chief Whip following claims he drunkenly groped two men in a private members club. The Sunday Times reports that Pincher is also alleged to have made unwanted passes at two Conservative MPs in 2017 and 2018. Former head of the Civil Service, Lord Kerslake, told Times Radio that the Prime Minister must have known about Pincher's past. It's unlikely that they would have been made and not been known by the Prime Minister in one form or another. So he had a reputation, it seems, um, and it does therefore make it uh, even more surprising that he was given the role of Deputy Chief Whip. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister and Chancellor have promised the single biggest tax cut in a decade to help ease the cost of living crisis, writing jointly in The Sun on Sunday. They outlined planning to spend billions to cushion the blow of inflation by also providing relief for council tax bills, fuel duty and energy costs. Ross Johnson and Rishi Sunak say it could save every household £330 per year. It says the Conservatives' 2019 election pledge to build 40 new hospitals by 2030 faces a review by the government's spending watchdog. Shadow Health Secretary West Streeting asked for an investigation into delays surrounding the programme and warned of taxpayers' money being wasted. A poll for the Sunday Times shows that Scottish voters are split over whether a second independence referendum should be held next year and how they would vote. The panel-based poll shows that 44% oppose Nicola Sturgeon's plan for a vote next October, with 43% in favour. 48% said they'd vote for independence. 47% said they wouldn't. The Queen's role has been rewritten by Buckingham Palace. In its annual report, Her Majesty's official duties have been edited for the first time. Events in late opening of Parliament have been removed. The 96-year-old's mobility issues have recently forced her to pull out of several commitments. A charity watchdog is investigating a string of secretive deals between Prince Charles and a controversial Tory peer. According to the Sunday Times, Lord Brownlow spent £1.7 million bailing out the Prince's failed eco-village in Knockroon in Scotland. In 2013, Charles appointed Brownlow as a trustee of the Prince's Foundation, which manages Dumfries House his 18th century country estate in Scotland. And the Transport Secretary says new airport staff are being security checked in record times to Chinese travel chaos ahead of the peak of the summer holidays. Grant Shapp says most counter-terror checks are coming back in less than 10 days, half the time taken in March. It comes after months of disruption at the UK airports as the industry struggles with staffing shortages and soaring demand. Now time for today's weather. Sponsors Talk TV Weather. This morning, a bright start for many, but an increasing risk of showers as the morning progresses. Some of the showers could be on the heavy side as we head towards lunchtime. Taking a look at the details for midday and across northern Scotland, it will be breezy with a mix of sunshine and showers. Temperatures ranging from 12 to 16 Celsius. The rest of Scotland will also see sunshine and showers, some perhaps heavy. Showers will start to ease across western parts of Northern Ireland, but further east and also across northern England, showers could be heavy. Temperatures hovering around 16 Celsius. The sunshine and showers theme continues across Wales the Midlands and East Anglia. Some heavy in places, but temperatures in the sun lifting to 17 Celsius. A few showers are also possible for southern England and the Channel Islands. As we move into the evening, showers will tend to clear eastwards, allowing many places to become dry. Trust us to take you there. Times Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Welcome back, my friends. I just don't know where the time has gone. We've been absolutely flying through the first hour. We're well in now to the second hour. And lots of really nice tweets and messages. Uh, but also, it's good to have a broad church of people with different views, and some people are not quite so sure. It's very nice to have uh, Namron, who is uh, pro-EU, uh, pro-rejoining the EU. Uh, he is uh, quite a regular listener, actually, and he's, uh, he's messaged in that uh, Talk TV is a Tory party propaganda channel set up by Murdoch. Its presenters are Murdoch puppets. But hang on, Namron, I've been also accused of attacking Boris too much. And how can I be a Tory puppet if I'm leader of a different political party? I don't quite see how that follows, but there we are. Uh, keep, uh, keep listening. It's great to have you as part of the show. Now, the King of Pentacles says that, uh, Richard, closing down the conversation on the World Economic Forum and their influence quicker than Boris uh, is, uh, it's not, is not a conspiracy theory, it's in plain sight. Uh, why do you think Boris is pursuing these insane green net zero policies? But I actually just haven't really got much time for this conspiracy theory. I just don't think they are, uh, in a sense, uh, that organised, that bright. I just think there's, you know, there are lots of challenges in the world. And uh, I think that the whole net zero thing, I don't know if it's coming from the, uh, uh, from the WEF. I think that's coming mainly from, uh, from Boris's other half and various people like Joe Biden and uh, John Kerry. But there we are. We've got to keep battling against what I call the net zero madness. And that's why I want to have a section, hopefully every week, certainly every fortnight, a climate sanity section to, uh, to really debate all of the various issues around it because we hear so much catastrophizing. And in some sense, you're almost not allowed to debate some of this stuff. Uh, it's... You know, it, it's it's much more vitriolic than Brexit. Again, it makes Brexit look like a walk in the park. I tried to organise a small rally up in Bolton. Well, I mean, the intimidation and the threats to the venue owner uh, was one thing. And one of the uh, concerns constantly raised is uh, the melting ice caps and the sea level rising and we're all going to be swamped and islands are going to disappear. And I, that's why I was fascinated to read an article recently by Joachim Book entitled, Are Low-Lying Islands Helpless in the Face of Sea Level Rise? And Joachim is a research fellow at the American Institute of Economic Research and is with me now on Zoom uh, this morning on Ties Talk. Joachim, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. So, uh, lots of uh, climate catastrophizing by so many people. It was only recently uh, a lady was in tears. She was so anxious in an interview on Talk TV, and you've got people like the esteemed Washington Post editorial warning back in 2019 that uh, there would be six and a half feet increase in sea levels by 2100 that would swamp as much territory as the whole of Western Europe and make 187 million people homeless. So we should all be terrified and deeply concerned, is that right? Absolutely. Um, uh, thanks a lot for having me on the show, Richard, and good morning to all of you. Uh, yeah, this is a this is this is a concern that comes up all the time, um, and people don't really look into it, and they don't really concern themselves with it. They just like look at the figures. They see hundreds of millions of climate refugees, and they go pretty crazy. We have all these surveys of kids in the UK being terrified out of their wits for you know the things that may happen from climate change, um, and I think it's. Like you mentioned, it's 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 important to to have a sanity check on this. I've called for a sensible environmentalism for a couple of years, and like have a more like sane approach to this. Uh, that's right, because the reality of that Washington Post forecast, which is the equivalent of about six and a half feet in in eighty years, uh, you put in your article, the reality is about one tenth of that is what's really happening. Why does why does that never appear in the Washington Post or or the New York Times? Yeah, I, I guess it doesn't produce as many clicks or sell, sell as many um, uh, as many newspapers. I don't know. Um, but the thing is that really bothers me is that you can look at the like they're referring to a real scientific journal article, and you can look at the article and see what they did. And what most articles do, and most um, um, serious climate researchers do, is that they sort of abstract away from. Uh, from what's known as ad adaptation, right? Like, it's very hard to know exactly how societies are going to respond to uh, to some kind of change in, in, in nature. Uh, so you basically just ignore it and you say, okay, let's imagine everyone stays where they are, everybody lives where they are, we don't upgrade any infrastructure, we don't do anything at all, and then we add 
a hundred years worth of, uh, of sea level rises uh, to that. What's going to happen? And then you get these maps of like, you know, half of London is flooded or like half of Vietnam, like all these maps where like certain areas, massive areas are going to be flooded and, you know, small islands in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean are going to disappear. Uh, and, and this, this idea that people are just going to sort of sit on their island and wait for sea level to rise and, and, and slowly, tragically drown is, of course, utter nonsense. And, I mean, Netherlands is a pretty good example of, of, of how to deal and how to adapt and how to react, isn't it? Yeah, Netherlands is my favourite example. It's something like a third of the country is below uh, the sea level. Uh, Schiphol, at Amsterdam International Airport, one of the most the busiest airports in Europe, is four metres, four metres below sea level. Uh, I didn't realize that. Is it flooded? Do we swim? Do do we do we land on water? No, we don't. We have engineering infrastructure to fix this. There we are. Exactly. And so uh, here's the other thing that I was fascinated in your article that you wrote on uh, human progress, where you were saying that actually some of the islands that have been highlighted that have been most at risk are actually seeing uh, an increase in their land mass as opposed to uh, being swamped by the sea. Yeah, I thought this was... In, so th- this fear comes up a lot, especially when whenever there's a climate summit coming around or The Guardian wants to run something. Uh, it's always like small islands in, 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 in the Pacific that are going to be completely swamped by, by, by sea level rises. And it sort of makes sense. They're small islands, they're very low-laying, they're very shallow. Um, and uh, so it sort of makes sense that a rising sea will eventually consume them entirely. Um, so I thought I would have a look. Like we've had rising sea levels for about, you know, for hundreds of years and they've been increasing uh, a tiny bit in recent decades. So certainly some of these islands should have disappeared a bit already, right? Which they should have lost land mass. Uh, so we look and the researchers who uh, who studied this find that no, most of these islands have grown in size, uh, partly because of sediments and partly because uh, because they're actually building uh, building out these islands. Like the Maldives is a perfect example that I brought up in, in the art in the article. They started in the 90s. They started building a new island next to their capital city because they wanted more space. Uh, and now it's the size of London. Wow. Um, and this is always this sort of uh, island that's going to be swamped by climate change. But they built a new one with sand and like they and following the, the lead of the Dutch, basically. So they've uh, been doing that funny thing called using their brains, adapting and reacting, which is, of course, you know, that's human intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But that's very. That's also very hard to 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 um, to project or pro- forecast in, a, in an academic article. So basically, what researchers do is say, well, let, let's assume that nothing happens. What what is the raw impact of nature um, from, from from a changing climate? And then you know they get these like projections, like oh yeah, 187 million climate refugees. And of course, like the headlines in the newspaper isn't if we do nothing, there's going to be a problem. It's 100 that's right. million. That's right. Just. Whilst you've been talking, Joachim, uh, Pablo has messaged in, there's been a sea level rise of give or take three millimetres uh, over the last hundred plus years. What's happening is that land has been rising and sinking since the last ice age. Is he right? Yeah. Um, so, so this is also something that people keep forgetting. They think of everything as one story. You know, It depends a lot where you are in the world. Some, some areas of the world are... Um, for, from melting glaciers and stuff, like particularly in Greenland, southern Alaska, um, um, Iceland, places like that, where uh, where the weight of the glaciers is reduced and the land is actually rising. So they have the, a lot of those places have the opposite problem, where the sea level is basically retracting um, from, because the land is rising. So I mean, you need to you, you need to keep you need to keep. Um, a, you, you can't look at this as like one story where everything happens the same everywhere. Like, it, it depends where you are to some extent. Sure, sure. I was also struck by the uh, one of the clauses in the latest IPCC uh, sixth report on... I'm one of those sad people that's actually read a chunk of it, and <laughs> I got to page 41. Do uh, I know, well, I got to page 41, uh, clause D1.6. If anybody wants to, you've just got to read this, because it actually said that even if we went to negative net zero, just think about that. If we went to negative net zero, which is what uh, lots of people are heading towards, want us to go towards with all the cost uh, and impoverishment that that would involve, there'd be no change to sea level rise for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah, that sounds about right. So, um, so that, I mean, one of the greatest concerns about climate change is the impact on the sea level rises but even if we did what they want us to do, 
it wouldn't make any difference for hundreds of years. So surely it would be much better, as you say, adapting and spend, spending money on infrastructure. Yeah, and I think if you ask climate scientists um, this honest question, like most of them agree that a lot of the impacts that we are foreseeing are already baked into the system. There's very little that we can do right now to prevent some of the climate change uh, effects over the next century. Uh, so we're still going to end up in a scenario where we have to do adaption, um, and then you know we, we might as well, well might as well focus on that. Joachim, you know? we can't uh, we can't please everybody. Uh, we've had a message in here that says um, get people who understand the climate to talk about climate change, not more nutters and deniers. There we go. We're not in denial of it. That's the whole point. We're not. Uh, we're, no. we're saying that it's happened forever. The deniers yeah. are the people that think this is a recent thing, isn't it? We actually read the, the IPCC reports and see what the actual science says. And most of the time, it's not the, 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 the stories that we see on the flashed across the headlines and the, and, the, and the apocalyptic, crazy stuff that we see from left to right. Like, climate science is a lot more serious than what it, what it seems from the front page of New York Times. I think that's right. We're saying, yes, there's climate change. There's always been climate change. There always will be. It's about how you react, how you adapt, how yeah. you use common sense. Yeah, we're, so this is a, a, a really crucial, crucial point that I try to make all the time. We're a lot more protected from nature today than we have ever been, you know, partly because we're richer and partly because we have the technology to protect ourselves against it. So even if and even like to the extent that climate change will harm our societies and change our societies, we're in a much better position to, um, to safeguard ourselves against that. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Joachim, thank you so much for coming on my show and for sharing those thoughts with me. A fascinating article you wrote on, wrote on human progress. I look forward to speaking to you again soon on this section that I'm going to be having regularly on my Thai Talk show called Climate Sanity. I really do think we need a lot more of that. We need to stop this catastrophizing. We need to be allowed to talk about it. Let me tell you, there are people who don't even want us to talk about it. Heard that before somewhere? Where was that? Stay with us. Lots to come up. Your calls and everything. It's Ty's Talk. It's Talk TV.
Welcome back to Tice Talk. We're well into the second hour. We've been talking about climate sanity, sea level rises, and I think lots of people on Twitter are agreeing with me, but some do not, and that's a good thing. And we can we can do we can disagree uh, agreeably. One here is from uh, someone who says it's amazing how businessmen, I think that's a reference to me, refuse to look at objective, accurate data and understand the facts saying that uh, sea level rise eight centimetres within a generation. Well, let's do the math, shall we? So a generation is 25 years, eight centimetres, that's 80 mil, that's about three millimetres a year. Exactly, that's the whole point. It's not what, uh, back in 1989, Noel Brown of the UN Environment Programme said when he said there was a 10-year window to solve the greenhouse problem, otherwise one-sixth of Bangladesh would be flooded, displacing a fo- a, about a quarter of its 90 million people. Well, so that would have happened by 2000. Has anyone heard whether or not a quarter of Bangladeshis have had to uh, be displaced or flooded in the last 22 years? Because otherwise, I think that bloke, Neil Brown, was completely wrong. He was making it up. He was catastrophizing. So I think the evidence actually shows that we do need to talk about this, but both sides of the debate. Let's look at the evidence and then let's have a discussion about it. What really concerns me... There is genuinely attempts to be able to shut down legitimate debate about this in the same way we weren't allowed, we were barely allowed to talk about certain issues during the depth of COVID. And this is really, really important. There are people who want us to say we can't talk about climate misinformation. Well, uh, until I'm physically stopped, I'm going to be talking about it on this show. Uh, Let's go to Essex where I've got Dave on the line. Morning, Dave. Oh, good morning, Richard. I'm I'm grateful for you taking my call. You know, these climate people, they really do take the mickey. I was a professional sailor in another life. And I can tell you, if you, they expect you to uh, ignore the, the, the established rules and laws. For example, Boyle's law of water displacement means if you take an iceberg, for example, and put it in the middle of an ocean, it remains an iceberg. It displaces the same amount of water, whether it is in a complete fluid form or a gigantic mountain. The water displacement is the same, but they expect you. The whole thing is a fraud, just like the coronavirus, just like the well, Ukraine I mean, the, uh, war. Uh, hang, on, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. Steady on, steady on, Dave. Look, um, steady on. Uh, coronavirus is a fact, and the Ukraine war is a fact. It's not a fraud, but I do, on climate change, I do wonder whether there are some massive, massive vested interests who are looking to, in a sense, uh, make a huge amount of money uh, whilst they put forward uh, their concerns about the impact of climate change. I would say to you, I will agree with you that the coronavirus was real. But the way we reacted to it was the fraud. And how we continue to react to it is a fraud. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in that. All I'm saying is these people that are conducting all this, the normal man in the street doesn't realise. I stood outside my church today and watched a a, a group of people, and they are, are, are oblivious to what's going on. And yet we're at war. We're under a sustained attack, a propaganda war. People don't understand because these people that are waging this war, like the Queen said, there are dark forces waged against us. These people, they well, I mean, plan in years. They, they plan in centuries. They've been setting us up for... Yeah, you see, I, mean, I, 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 I hear you, Dave. We're in trouble. Some people do plan very long term. The Chinese are very good at that. But I don't really buy into this whole sort of conspiracy theory that the WEF is planning for sort of change over decades and decades. But um, but there we are, Dave. Um, thank you so much for your thoughts uh, there. Uh, Dave, uh, like me on climate change, is concerned about, I think, some of the, uh, the interests of those who are promoting it. Let's go up to uh, Scotland, where Jim is there in North Lanarkshire. Jim, good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Did you hear my yeah, sermon this morning? Are you with me or are you phoning about something else? Yes, I've been on before to retain, but uh, I'll tell you what it is. I'll give you these few points. SNP, independence. What they're doing is they're creating an independence within Scotland. That's what they're doing. They're dividing people, and we're going back in. They're going to take us back into the EU. What independence is that? We have to hand back all our fishing rights, 
all the laws that we've gained from the EU will need to be handed back. And there's another point here that people miss. If the HNP win the independence vote, that, to me, equals one each. And when it's one each, you need a third to agree. <laughs> so, so you're basically of the, of, of the never-ending view. Yeah, a lot of people, well, a never-ending view, because that's what the SNP want. Uh, J. Robertson has declared that they will keep going and going until they get what they want. He has made a statement, it was in the paper, that he has said that he will keep, the SNP will keep going until they get what they want. So I am saying, if it's one each, there needs to be a third vote. Yeah, interesting point. But do you, do you agree with me, Jim, that actually we should negotiate the withdrawal agreement in draft form, ready to be signed, before the vote? And then, then there's, no, there's no mistake, there's no doubting what's involved. Yes, yes. But I also... I, also, I, I don't back indep Scottish independence uh, in any shape or form. And I'm, I'm Scottish. I'm Scottish first, and I'm British. And I'm proud of both being Scottish and I'm equally proud of being British. I enjoy going down to England, down to Bournemouth and the Torquays of this world. No, and I enjoy, I enjoy that thoroughly, and I do not want to see a, a, bar, a, a barrier or a border between no, us. Of, of course, no-one wants to see it's that. It's a 300-year union. I, exactly, and, and all of the relationships, family and friends, they're built up over those 300 yes. years. I mean... It's all any of us have ever, ever known. I mean, I, I genuinely think independence for Scotland would make Brexit look like a walk in a park. I think it would be so divisive, so disruptive for everybody. It would be, it would be decisive within, within uh, 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 Scotland. I mean, let's face it, I, I, I'm, more, more, I'm nearer uh, Glasgow than I'm Edinburgh. And see Glasgow and Edinburgh, we have rivals between us. Forget about Scotland and England. Edinburgh and Glasgow have rivalries between them. You do indeed. We don't, have to, we don't have to go down to England <laughs> to find rivalry, you know. Um, uh, and, and another, the last one is, united we stand, divided we fall. That's, that's, that's a, 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 such a good expression, actually, Jim. It, will, it really is up, absolutely uh, right. With that. No, I think that's right. And, and you, love, you love coming down to England, and I love going to Scotland. It's wonderful. Correct. Correct, exactly. There's beautiful places in England. Uh, uh, my wife and I have, have toured down there for years and years with car, and that's our, our enjoyment. Going down to England, doing the court shows, or just, doing the Torquays, or Bournemouth, or Great Yarmouth. So, and and, and uh, just, just finally, do you think Nicola is right not to be using oil and gas uh, and rushing towards net zero? She's wrong. She's wrong. I, I an actual fight, an actual fight, because of the Russian, uh, because of the Ukraine thing, we should be back in coal. And I, and a, a quick one across the bows. This shale oil, shale gas. I that's in, right. I was in, the, I was in the, uh, the, the the building industry all my days, and we had a site. I was senior manager, and we had a site. This is very quickly. We had a site down in the 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 the, the west of um, the, the the west coast here. And we were digging a new site, a new phase, and we got uh, archaeologists sent to check the ground over. And they found, sh uh, they, they found bear cast pits, mines. And what it was, the miners used to dig down so far, yep. and they would dig out so far, and they, what they were extracting was shale oil. Ah, oh, shale lamps. oil. Well, uh, this is a big week, and Jim. This, this is a big week. I've got to go to the news in a sec, but um, this should be a decision which was deferred from last week about shale gas, so watch the space. I'll be coming back to it, Jim. Coming up after the news, it's Howard Cox. Stay with us. It's the home of common sense. It's Talk TV. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and this is Talk TV. I think my most memorable and proudest moment in journalism over all these years is actually being on air during the lockdowns, uh, even when I had COVID myself. Over the last two years, getting people to tell their stories, not just about people who lost loved ones to COVID, but people who lost their fundamental freedoms, their children's schooling, their mental health, their physical health, their businesses, and giving people the chance to tell their stories about how it affected them. is Talk TV News. 
Good morning, I'm Nadira Tudor. Boris Johnson is under pressure to explain why he didn't act sooner to deal with allegations of sexual misconduct against Chris Pincher. He was suspended as a Tory MP on Friday after resigning as Deputy Chief Whip, following claims he drunkenly groped two men in a private members club. The Sunday Times reports that Pincher is also alleged to have made unwanted passes at two Conservative MPs in 2017 and 2018. Former head of the Civil Service, Lord Kerslake, told Times Radio that the Prime Minister must have known about Pincher's past. It's unlikely that they would have been made and not been known by the Prime Minister in one form or another. So he had a reputation, it seems, um, and it does therefore make it uh, even more surprising that he was given the role of Deputy Chief Whip. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister and Chancellor have promised the single biggest tax cut in a decade to help ease the cost of living crisis. Writing jointly in The Sun on Sunday, they outlined planning to spend billions to cushion the blow of inflation by also providing relief for council tax bills, fuel duty and energy costs. Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak say it could save every household £330 per year. And a poll for The Sunday Times shows that Scottish voters are split over whether a second independence referendum a should be held next year and how they would vote. The panel-based poll shows that 44% opposed Nicola Sturgeon's plan for a vote next October, with 43% in favour. 48% said they'd vote for independence. 47% said they wouldn't. And the Queen's role has been rewritten by Buckingham Palace in its annual report. Her Majesty's official duties have been edited for the first time in at least a decade. Specific events, including the state opening of Parliament, have been removed. The 96 year olds mobility issues have recently forced her to pull out of several commitments. That's all for now. We'll have more in half an hour. Welcome back to Ty Stock. Well, it's all kicking off, I must say. Apparently I'm a hypocrite uh, because I just shut down debate live on air about Dave's uh, discussion about uh, the issue of uh, whether or not there's a conspiracy theory. I didn't actually shut it down. Actually, Dave uh, had his say, and I just said I don't buy into it. Uh, but there we are. It's good to read out every different view. Uh, then there's another one. Um, Car uh, Gary, white ma van man, is going absolutely tonto uh, about Brexit. Um, he sent me a very long message. I may get to that later on. But, uh, Gary, thank you for your messages. Keep listening. It's good to be able to debate and discuss this stuff. And also, we need to uh, debate something that... In a sense, all of us uh, are, are suffering from at the moment, which is, uh, it's a sort of the disease of high fuel costs, frankly, uh, and it's a very, very uh, painful uh, disease because the price of fuel, as you all know, has gone absolutely through the roof and I've committed once a month to have a section in this show called Talk Gear and delighted that Howard Cox is uh, my regular guest on that and Howard is with me in the studio. Good uh, Good morning, Howard. I can't believe it's a month since we last Sorry. since we last met on this issue. I mean, and what a month it's been. I mean, the price of fuel continuing, uh, sadly, to go north, not south. Who knows where it's going to go? But um, there's a lot to discuss. And anybody who wants to ask a question for uh, Howard on anything related to fuels, on fuel tax, what's going on in your your local petrol station? then uh, do give us a call. We'll get, get you put straight through and you can put that question straight to Howard. Uh, but first of all, Howard, let's talk about what's happening tomorrow because it seems there's, um, uh, there's quite a bit of strength of feeling uh, going to manifest itself. Well, there's several groups, and, and, and thanks for having me on again, Richard. Really enjoy this. Um, we're seeing lots of groups get together and actually do, they're going to do go slow rolling sort of a, uh, uh, about 100 cars and trucks and things going down various motorways wow. right across the country um, and simply at the protest at this high price of uh, fuel. And uh, I've been asked to join in on lots of them, but unfortunately I can't get to every one of them. <laughs> uh, they're right across the country, the M4, M25, M54, I think there's some in Scotland as well. Certainly in and, and is this coordinated or is this sort of uncoordinated 
it's sort of it, semi coincidence. It, there is sort of uncoordinated cohesion, if you see, okay, understand yes. that. I've, that's the only way I can say about it. I, I've had loads of emails and things, but they're all from different people. And needed to say the media are contacting me to say who's doing this or who's doing that. But there doesn't seem to be one central person that's involved with it. I think there may be two or three in the north where one person is doing it. But, I, but the frustration is, is palpable. And that's the yes. reason why this is happening. And, and the government must wake up and realise that, uh, you know, we're not uh, extinction rebellion. We don't glue ourselves to roads, but this is really effective people's lives and this has been sort of growing I, I think I sensed three or four weeks ago the prospect that something like this may happen and in a sense people's frustration is just rising and rising well I'm in discussions to do a legal protest in Westminster and uh, it will be very easy I'm backed by the Road Haulage Association for example and and I, there's loads of groups I'm talking to and all of them want me to do what happened in 2000 and that's blockade London uh, but I don't do that sort of thing what we do need to do I'm all for doing a legal protest in Whitehall with maybe a hundred trucks going down there that's great and this is the thing isn't it the key word there is legal legal protest uh, to express one's frustration as opposed to the illegal process from what I call the fanatics, the yeah. extremists who glue themselves to key parts of our road network uh, and therefore they disrupt and obstruct illegally and get away with it far too easily in my view whereas what you're talking about is in a sense it's a go slow it's so yeah. it's, it's, it, it's noticeable but it's not illegal and it's not... They're, they're uh, going to be doing 30 miles an hour down the roads, so it's a go slow, and the police will not arrest you unless you are causing a total blockage uh, in terms sure. of actually holding everything up completely. And, and I think that you'll find that they'll be doing it in, on motorways just on the inside two lanes. Right. And, and so you can overtake. Obviously, it's going to be, you know, you've got to be careful. And I think the police will be around them escorting sure. them, making sure. But the sort of thing we need to do is actually do some legal uh, protests. And I, I think this is going to escalate, Richard. It's going to get more and more because the price at £2 a litre is more than crippling. It's debilitating. It, absolutely. And I'm hearing it now uh, from more and more businesses. And you're seeing it on invoices yes. where, where, you know, someone's provided a service... And all of a sudden now, they're basically having to add fuel onto the invoice because it's becoming so significant. And, and some businesses essentially... Uh, withdrawing services from certain areas because it just doesn't pay to get there. Well, that's right. But when you see that uh, we are, for diesel, on average, I looked at 36 European countries, not just EU, I looked at all of the, the European, uh, the continental Europe. I looked at 36 countries at what they're charging for diesel. On average, we are 25p more for diesel and for petrol, we're 20p more. And that just goes to show something, especially as Germany have just cut their fuel duty by 25 pence. Yes, I saw um, that. So we're, on average, we're 25... Yeah, between 20 and 25 more. for both fuels, more uh, than any, and any in Europe. There are, uh, some of the Scandinavian countries are more expensive for petrol, but they're less for diesel. And as you know, diesel's always priced more over here than petrol. Nowhere else in the world that happens. In, indeed. Now, I'm quite sure that someone will message in saying that that's another uh, <laughs> sign that Brexit is a disaster. Far from it, my friends... Uh, the opportunity to cut taxes rests with uh, this government. Totally. And as you've just said, Germany, uh, they decided to cut their tax. And you know, I, uh, in my economic plan, my emergency plan that I put forward a couple of weeks back, I said we should be having a 20p cut. Yep. And front of, I was a bit nervous at the time, Howard, mm. when I put that forward, that even then that would turn out to be too little. <laughs> If, if it kept rising, and it's it's crept up a bit since then, but we've no idea where it's going to go from here. Well, no, especially... What's so frustrating is that we, we're seeing, in the case of petrol, in the, la in the month of June, wholesale price of petrol fell by something like 13 pence. But the, at the pumps, it went up by 16 pence. <sighs> now, I mean, what's going on? And this is the point. Now, we've got this CMA inquiry that Kwasi Kwarteng has actually convened and asked to happen. Yes. But it, I, I'm worried about it's going to be a whitewash, and he's really only looking to ask the question, why wasn't that 5p cut in fuel duty passed on to motorists? So, which, is, which is not touching the sides. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about that after the break, the CMA inquiry. If anybody wants to ask a question of Howard uh, on anything to do with taxes, what's happening in your local area? Have you seen tax cuts passed on? Have you seen retailers kindly cut their profit margins? We need also to talk about the wholesalers who may or may not be racketeering because uh, there's just so much uh, going on. And that issue of 
uh, the legal go slow protest is fascinating. It'd be interesting whether or not the media cover that tomorrow. Well, I, I've been approached by the media uh, quite a lot for tomorrow's. I, I'm doing some of your competitors and, and, and Sky as Goodness well. Goodness me, really? Yeah, I'm sorry, Richard. <laughs> oh, all right, if you must. <laughs> Right, so you think the media will cover it tomorrow? I, I think so, I think so. so uh, uh, I don't think it'd be massive, I don't think the BBC would touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Funny that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely uh, for sure. Well, um, I, I think, and if that, if those protests grow, then of course what we might see is a subsequent level of protests. I think so, I just hope it's, it, it works out tomorrow as a, 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 basically a nudge to number 10 to say, come on. We've got to do something about it. Because if you, they don't do anything... Rishi's had plenty of time, as you said, and in Germany, 25, France, 13 pence, 17 pence in France, 17 pence in Ireland. They've all cut fuel duty. Why have we only cut it by 5p? This is the time to act now. You, you can sort of see, because they always sort of react. Yeah. And it's funny, isn't it? They all sort of basically throw a dead cat onto the table <laughs> in order to distract from another crisis. And let's just think, shall we? Um, have the Tories got another crisis? Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, pinch me. <laughs> pinch me, pinch me, pincher is another crisis. Stay with us. We're going to be coming back. I want your calls, your views with Howard Cox. Not about pinching, but about fuel duty, about the protests, uh, everything, to, anything to do with road haulage and driving. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk. It's Talk TV. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here. We're well through the second hour. There's so much to discuss. So many of you getting involved, which I really do appreciate. Lots of messages coming in also for Howard. 
Uh, one here says, uh, Howard giving a good, a good account of himself. Thanks for sticking up for uh, the motorist. Another one saying from Jim in Telford, Howard, saying, uh, how do I get involved? Where do I find out? I guess that's about the protests. Are there various websites? Yeah, I, if I were to just type in for fuel pro uh, protests uh, uh, for July 4th, and I think you'll see a list coming up, and there's a lot of local newspapers covering them. OK, perfect. That's very helpful. I hope that answers that. Uh, then there's one here saying the... Uh, what have we got? Uh, I live in Leon C, Tesco garage, 184 for petrol, a mile up the road, BP garage is 193. <laughs> is that a classic sort of... BP versus supermarket difference. Yeah, yes, it is, but it's 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 becoming rarer, Richard, because most of these supermarkets now are being taken over by private equity companies and businesses like that, and they're actually being more profit driven yes. rather than actually customer driven. That, that's absolutely right. Now, uh, that's a couple of thoughts on uh, the messages and Twitter, but uh, we've got Craig on the line from uh, where's Craig? Ilkley, I think. Hi, Craig. Hello. Hi. Good morning, Richard. Hello, good morning. Howard. Good morning. Hello. Have you got a question for Howard? I do have a question. So, you know, when I think back to my school days, and they always showed you in the science books the side elevation of a of a refinery in uh, in full operations, and you have crude oil at the bottom and the likes of aviation fuel at the top, and somewhere in between there's diesel yep. and petrol and um, diesel would appear to be much closer to crude oil than what petrol is. Correct. Therefore, in my logic, it should be a lot cheaper at the pumps. And I'd like to ask Howard, how come that's not the case? Why is diesel significantly more expensive than petrol when it's therefore cheaper to manufacture? Well, I've been asking this same question since I started this campaign in 2010. So we're, d we're talking 12 years asking question. No one seems to be able to answer that question. But we are the only nation uh, in the, that actually taxes uh, diesel the same as petrol. Uh, at the moment, 52.95. It's just come down from 57.95. Uh, whereas uh, other nations, particularly in Europe, actually uh, tax diesel because it's the commercial heartbeat uh, of, of the economy. They tax it less. And, and, and to answer your question, you're absolutely right. Diesel's almost a, a byproduct of, of, of getting to petrol and it, and, it, and it's not volatile we import pe a lot more diesel we get 18 percent of it from russia um but that that means we still get to, uh 82 percent from the rest of the world and we should be negotiating with those countries to uh, up, uh, up our imports from them so we don't get uh, blackmailed by the russian problem one of the other things that happens also is the uh, the speculators in london also gamble on various fuel petrol and diesel and we get into a situation whereby we're in their hands and this is what the, the I hope the Competitions and Market Authority inquiry will do something about. So, um, uh, does that help you there, Craig? It, it does, and I fully support Howard's campaign and wish him all the best, uh, uh, you know, for fighting for as as most. Craig, so, you're yeah, a star. Thank, thank you, you so much, much thank for you calling. Much. Uh, that was Craig with his question there. Why do we import 18% of our diesel from Russia? I don't know the history of it, Richard, but it's 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 grown over the last five or six years. I think we were doing about eight or nine percent, well, about ten years ago. Uh, but as you know, uh, diesel is not so volatile as petrol, so we have to refine it here because you can't transport petrol in tankers. It, they would be walking or yeah. uh, floating bombs. Uh, the diesels, excuse me, the volatile. You can put a match to diesel and it won't light. Correct. Those sorts of things, and that's the reason why we do that. But the, you know, Craig was dead right. It, it is actually further uh, earlier in the actual distillation phase of getting to fuels, diesel comes out first, virtually. Second, or that sort of thing. And, and why, why we're not actually jumping on uh, the government to say why we're pricing so high, we should be taxing it less as well. Um, just a quick message here. Before we talk about the CMA, uh, tweets here from, uh, from uh, Key Kev, Kev the Red, who says, I'm hearing of more petrol stations insisting on pay before yeah. you fill up at the pump uh, because there are more drivers. Fair. Yeah, absolutely right. They, they, what they tend to do is actually before you even press the button, you've got to, they've got to realise you must have £100 to actually pay you've got from to your, your money in whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, and they take a pound out, et cetera, from that point of view. But something like the 60% increase in people actually not, you know, driving off from four courts at the moment. Wow. So let's talk about this, uh, this CMA inquiry yeah. announced by the Business Secretary. Uh, it's sort of, you know, classic government sort of, is it just a case of kicking the can down the road? I mean, how long is it going to take um, and, and how will it help? Well, there's, there's, let me take you a bit of history about this. In 2013, we actually uh, initiated, uh, 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 and, and it was called the Office of Fair, Fair Trading. Now it's become the Competitions M Market Authority. And I had loads of MPs. We actually camped out outside the uh, uh, the OFT offices, and we we were asking basically to look at the pricing process and how it's actually arrived at. Because as you know, when oil prices change, whether it's the exchange rate, etc., or whether it's market uh, geopolitical events, etc., we have no idea the the changes on oil up or down. We have no idea 
idea what that means when we're filling up our cars, what the price of uh, fuel is. And it is never the same. You can have oil, at, for the sake of argument, in, in pounds be £90 a barrel, which is the sort of level we're at at the moment. Uh, we've been £90 before, and yet petrol is cheaper. And diesel is cheaper. These are the sorts of things. Now, all I'm asking for is transparency and sure. fairness. But, but do you, I mean, is this inquiry going to take a month? Short, sharp shock, or is it just kicked down the road for six to 12 months, which well, is hopeless? Well, I haven't been spoken to but uh, uh, on the record, but off the record I've been spoken to by a couple of ministers that I think could be involved with it, and they want me to be involved with it, and they've asked already who we should we be talking to, and it's a shame that they have to ask someone to actually who should they be talking about. If, I mean, the process is simple. There are seven refineries, there's the wholesalers, we've got them all listed, we've got distributors, we've got people that own big forecourts, and I, I must repeat this thing, I've spoken about this time and time again, the small independent retailers do not make much money they're making between two to four p per litre uh, and, and, and that, uh, to me that's fair but for some reason or other that they're getting abuse and people are attacking them so so the inquiry you're not quite sure how long that's going to no, take no i've no idea uh and i guess the question is even if it does uh produce some concerns is whether or not they actually do anything about it um a question just come in from uh, andrew uh can you ask it's actually howard not steve but there we are um if BP is so much more expensive than, let's say, Tesco's, yeah. as an example, and, and that's just one situation I, I hasten to add, is their product better quality or is that just an urban myth? Well, they're, they're, I, there's, I'm getting more and more people saying that they, they've had to repair their cars after going to a supermarket and filling up compared to the BPs and, and, and the Shells and, and, and the SOs because they put more detergent in to clean up things and their fuel is better. But I think it is more an urban myth than real fact. Um, and I, there's, I, I, fill up, I filled up yesterday at Sainsbury's and my car's going fine. Interesting. Um, uh, Pablo says, Russia refines our fuel and funds those who campaign to reduce our own domestic refining and production. That's interesting. Uh, interesting thought. So I think it's... Um, uh, that does bring us on to the issue of uh, the potentially cleaner fuels, because yeah. obviously after 2030, no one's going to be allowed to sell a new combustion engine car. Uh, I, I've got an electric car, but I have to say there is no chance of the grid being able to cope no. with the sort of quant of millions of electric cars. Just no chance at all. There won't be the chargers. There's not the capacity in the grid, and there won't be by 2030. I'm, I'm looking very closely. Um, what work is being done on cleaner, um, more efficient, in terms of emissions, combustion engines, in order for that part of the automotive industry to say to government, actually, we've cleaned up our act, so to yeah. speak, and therefore you should give us another uh, another extension. Well, fuels are being, clean, being cleaned up. In the case of diesel, we, uh, there's a standard called Euro 6, and Euro 6 diesel is very, very clean. In fact, it's cleaner than petrol uh, at the moment in time. But what the government have done with this 2030 threat, the ban, it's still not passed in legislation. It is part of their policy now, and, and, and they, I think they're entrenched to it. And uh, were you aware, Richard, that this week Germany, I think Italy, and Japan, and France have moved away from the 2035 ban of uh, diesel and petrol vehicles? I but, wasn't actually, have yeah, they? It, that yeah. hasn't had much coverage in our press. No, I wonder why. Uh, Funny that. It, Exactly, Richard. And this is the frustration we've got, etc. I'm actually uh, working with the Alliance of British Drivers and the Motorcycle Action Group, and we're funding a, a, a report to actually the true cost-benefit analysis of actually banning uh, new, the sales of new diesel and petrol cars for 2030. And that, that's going to be a major report. We're spending a lot of money on this to prove that, the government... That sounds a really, really interesting report. What's the timing on that? Well, we, I would say within the next two months. Uh, that be, could be before the uh, probably, probably for the the winter uh, uh, session in Parliament. Okay. We're trying to get it out for. So, um, uh, interesting tweet just come in here from John, who says uh, a small garage near Haverhill always cheaper than the local supermarkets. That's encouraging in a way. Yeah, I mean it's interesting because there's, there are ways to do this, but I bet you that that garage is actually on incredibly low margins. Clearly, I mean, I mean, but that's the joy of competition. Exactly, but the point is, uh, the, we're, all, we're asking for for Quasi Quarting and Grant Chaps, Boris and uh, uh, and Rishi is can we please ask the right people the right questions? That means drivers as well, because so many drivers contact me and say, "I'm just in the forecourt now. There's been no delivery, and yet the, the price has changed from going into the till and coming out." Those sorts of things are happening now. Again, it's a bit anecdotal there before I'm attacked by the Petrol Retailers Association. I'm on your side, guys, the Petrol Retailers Association. We just want honesty at the pumps. But it feels to me, I mean, this is so critical and it's it's now so expensive. It's impacting on absolutely everybody. Yes. There does need to be more transparency. I just want, you know, this inquiry sounds 
a right step in the right direction, but it needs to happen quickly. It can't be kicked down the road for months and months and months. Uh, it's got to happen quickly. And then do you think we might end up looking towards a sort of fuel stabiliser type scenario? Well, again, we've got to look at it. Are we going to be staying at this level of oil prices around the world? I don't think so. I think, yet again, it'll, we, do you remember that uh, this time, round about a year ago, we were 60 pence cheaper at yeah. the pumps? So you, don't, you think it'll go higher or lower from here? I, I still think it's going to continue to go high, but at the moment, oil is actually stuck around about the $115 to $120 level. We did hit $140 at one stage. Yes. Uh, and and uh, who knows what's going to happen? If... The, the Middle East actually start actually recognising the fact is if we have low oil prices, the whole of the global economy actually explodes into prosperity. It would benefit them. And I don't understand this control over our lives. Now, there's 37 million drivers in this country. You're one of about half a million that drive electric vehicles. And I'm pro-electric vehicle, big time. They have yeah. their place. Um, but G. Bester, I think he's, he's just uh, messaged in, why are we pushed, being pushed to EV cars when IC cars are so clean these days. Absolutely right. He's got it spot on. You, in fact, going back to your question, uh, what we need to do, because, because of that edict, we're not developing, we've got Euro 6, we're not developing Euro 7, we're not developing Euro 8. In the last 10 years, the Road Haulage Association have, have said, to us, uh, said to me that the uh, hauliers have actually cleaned up their act by something like 50% in terms of lower emissions. But that's not headline news. Exactly. It, th this is the thing, isn't it, that the, in a sense, there is some really exciting yep. technological developments, because that's what happens, Hydro we make progress, engineers, e but we're not hearing about some of the stuff on the combustion engines. No, we're not, we're, we're not at all, and yet... Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you've got to keep uh, banging the drum and doing what you do, because you're right there, literally yeah. at the sharp end, knowing how it is. Uh, protest tomorrow, folks, keep it legal, keep it lawful, uh, but keep it, um, you know, let's make sure that we get it out there in the media. Howard, thank you so much for coming in. We will keep doing this once a month. Once a month. It is so vital. It's part of climate sanity. Yeah. It's Ty's Talk. It's Talk TV.
TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Talk TV News at 12. Good afternoon, I'm Nadira Tudor. A cabinet minister has defended Boris Johnson, saying he wasn't aware of any specific allegations when he appointed Chris Pincher as the deputy chief whip. Mr Pincher was suspended as a Conservative MP on Friday following claims that he drunkenly groped two men at a private members club. The Secretary of State for Department of Work and Pensions, Theresa Coffey, rejected claims the Prime Minister was slow to act. I think the Prime Minister took very quick action, actually. Um, not only he was out of the country uh, in discussion with the Chief Whip when specific allegations had been made, uh, then uh, the Whip uh, was removed. Um, in the meantime, um, Chris had resigned as Deputy Chief Whip uh, and uh, that uh, resignation had been accepted. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister and Chancellor have promised the single biggest tax cut in a decade to help ease the cost of living crisis, writing jointly in the Sun on Sunday. They outline planning to spend billions to cushion the blow of inflation by also providing relief for council tax bills, fuel duty and energy costs. Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak say it could save every household £330 per year. It says the Conservatives' 2019 election pledge to build 40 new hospitals by 2030 faces a review by the government's spending watchdog. Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting asked for an investigation into delays surrounding the programme and warned of taxpayers' money being wasted. A poll for the Sunday Times shows that Scottish voters are split between those that support and oppose Scottish independence. 48% of people said they'd vote for independence, but 44% said a second referendum should not be held. The Transport Secretary says new airport staff are being security checked in record time to try and ease travel chaos ahead of the peak of the summer holidays. Grant Schapp says most counter-terror checks are coming back in less than 10 days, half the time taken in March. It comes after months of disruption at the UK's airports as the industry struggles with staffing shortages and soaring demand. And the Queen's oh. workload is set to be further reduced with events including the state opening of Parliament written out of her job description. The 96-year-old's mobility issues have recently forced her to pull out of several commitments. Those are the latest news headlines still to come. Your talk sport update. But first, your weather. Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather. Showers will tend to ease from the west as we move through the afternoon and into the evening with plenty of sunshine developing across Wales and southwest England in particular. Taking a look at the details for 7 o'clock and it will remain cloudy and breezy across western Scotland with outbreaks of rain. Eastern and southern Scotland will be mainly dry with sunny spells and temperatures around 14 Celsius. A few showers for Northern Ireland, otherwise a fine end to the day. Mostly dry and sunny for Northern England too, just the odd showers in the east. Sunny to the end of the day across Wales and the West Midlands, cloudy skies for the East Midlands and East Anglia and still the odd shower. Southern England will also be mainly dry with the best of the sunshine holding on in the West. Showers will continue to move south across Scotland and Northern Ireland as we move into the early hours elsewhere staying dry. Trust us to take you there. Times Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello again. UEFA has announced it's taking measures to tackle a rise in online abuse for footballers. The European governing body says a new moderation technology will be rolled out across all key platforms like Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. TalkSport has been told Cristiano Ronaldo could prioritise playing in the Champions League over playing for Manchester United. It comes as reports suggest the Portuguese captain has told the club to accept any satisfactory offer should they receive one. A Rugby World Cup winner has urged England to stand by head coach Eddie Jones going into next year's World Cup in France. Jones is facing scrutiny after England lost to Australia yesterday in the first of a three-match series 
But Neil Back says Jones should be the man to lead England into next autumn's competition. Wales captain Dan Bigger has defended the nature of their play against South Africa despite receiving three second half yellow cards in Pretoria. They were beaten 32-29 by the champion, world champions on a day where all four of the home nations tasted defeat. And both of Britain's remaining players at Wimbledon aim to make the quarterfinals today. Cam Norrie faces 30th seed Tommy Paul, while Heather Watson takes on Julie Niemeyer. At comes on the day Centre Court celebrates its centenary. That's all for now. I'll be back with more in half an hour. The Sunday Night Club is your club. I'll take you inside the dressing room, from the terraces to the boardroom, to ask the questions you want answered. There is no membership required for the Sunday Night Club from Seven. Welcome back, one and all. Unbelievably, we are into the afternoon. Where did the morning go? I'm not sure, but I think it went talking about Nicola, talking about the independence, Scotland, the negotiation, me taking the role of Michel Barnier, who knows whether or not that's a good idea or not. Uh, meanwhile, lots of messages coming in thanking Howard Cox for his good work. Good point here. We'll talk about this next time. Can you speak to the idea of hydrogen fuel cells to power cars? Feasibility. Uh, I'll make a note to talk about that. Uh, another time. Pablo says the Dutch power grid can't handle the influx of electric car charging points. I'm absolutely certain that is a similar issue here in the UK. So, uh, and lots of more messages I just can't get to because we've still got so much more to discuss. And moving on, delighted also to welcome to the studio uh, two ladies who played such a key role during the whole COVID crisis, essentially representing probably the most important part of all of our lives, which is children. Yes, because actually they are our future, literally. And uh, Liz Cole and Mozzie, Molly Kingsley, you set up um, us for them uh, very early doors and were a sort of a, a massive advocate for children. And you've just written a, a book, The Children's Inquiry, haven't you? Um, uh, and, I mean, in a sense... It's unbelievable, first of all, I know you've done lots of media, that, in a sense, you have to state the fact that children are a priority and there should be an inquiry into what was done, the decisions that were made. I mean, the truth is they're not a priority, which is why we felt it was so important to write a book highlighting the many ways in which, you know... In fact, it's not, it's not even, Richard, that they're not a priority. It's that they didn't feature at all in the thinking in the last two years. And we felt it very important to get a record down of how that happened and how we make sure it doesn't happen again. So you've written this book, which uh, essentially has just been launched and is available. I'm going to do a quick plug here. Uh, <laughs> where, Liz, where is it available? How, how do you get hold of this book? <laughs> yeah, so it's available via the usual outlets, Amazon, directly from our publisher, Pinter and Martin, okay. and also Hive Stores, which is an independent outlet, so various different ways that okay. people can access So it. that's called The Children's Inquiry, and so you talk about, in a sense, what happened, uh, and then you finish with, I think, something really important, which is the way forward, and please, uh, anybody who's got ideas, what they think is, is working or, or not working in the world of education, right down from early years right up to university, please do uh, give us a call and we'll put your question to Liz or Molly, you know, the number 0344 499 1000. This last section, the last chapter, is actually what I was truly fascinated by, about the way forward, how we go from where we are and be optimistic and say we can do so much better, let's get better. What, you know, what, what were the, sort of the key recommendations going forward? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to point out here is that actually what we found in writing the book was that many of these issues had, there were pre-existing issues. You know, children's lives weren't a calm sea before the pandemic. You know, there's a reason why our children here in the UK are some of the unhappiest in the Western world, and we need to look at that. Um, so there are a number of areas that we look at, the first one being putting in that um, those safeguards in place um, to make sure that this doesn't happen to children again. And I think providing that foundation and that security is absolutely vital. Um, so one of the things that we've called for and we've called for repeatedly 
um, is for schooling to be recognised as essential infrastructure, which is what it should always have been. And as we now see um, attendance rates really plummeting in school, it's hardly surprising when children have had that ambiguity and been told for the last two years that their schooling is optional. So we see this very much as an opportunity for the government actually to grasp yeah. and send that strong message to say actually, no, we are going to um, ring-fence schooling as essential. So that's one of the first first things is putting that in place. Because I think, Molly, it's really important to look at international comparisons and, and to learn, because, you know, we'd love to be the best at everything, but the reality is that's never going to be the case. And you're saying, uh, Cindy said in your books, only 64% of our 15-year-olds are happy compared to about 90% in the Netherlands. And so you talk about sort of reimagining schools and learning from that. Yeah, and I think the really important point here, I think on the substance, so I think as Liz said, the first thing is we need to safeguard, we need to protect, we need to make sure the same mistakes aren't made. I think we can then talk about what would the substance of, you know, it's been called recovery, but actually we would like to be far more ambitious than that because we don't want to recover to a point that was broken we want to do something transformational for this generation so let's call it reimagining and i think that is where we ought to look to overseas and you know the nordic countries rightly get held up they do many things right for children there's other countries too so for example estonia who consistently yes. now rank top of the rankings in educational attainment but also very high in overall health and well-being and i think the point to make here on the substance is education gets a lot of the column inches in the press but actually it's more than that what we really need now in light of what's happened in the pandemic is an integrated you know education social care and health plan that's right because you use this word that actually it's important children have fun that, and that it's not a footnote but it's a critical part of well-being and I think you said that actually in Finland for example they do that really well yeah, I mean, I think there's many countries that do well-being far better. And the really interesting thing is often in this country, particularly by successive conservative governments, well-being is seen as something that actually works against educational yeah. attainment. So, you know, you can either have happy kids or you can have ones that do well at school. And that is a totally false dichotomy. Of you course. know, the data consistently shows that you need happy, thriving children before you can even think about attainment. You know, there have been many, many studies done in places as diverse of Peru, Mexico, Bhutan, yeah. <laughs> in controlled study recent. It sounds like it sounds like basic common sense that you're going to learn better if you yeah. uh, if you are happy. Um, we are getting. We can head up to Yorkshire because I think I've got Roz on the line. Roz, are you there? I'm here. Yeah. Hi there. Good afternoon. I must remember it's the afternoon. Um, hi, Roz. Uh, thanks for calling. Have you got a question for Liz and Molly? Yeah, because my son. I mean, we're talking about normal school children, right? Yes, normal normal my, school children. My, how how old's your son, Roz? He's thirteen. He's autistic, and they they seem to forget. For some reason, they seem to forget the the side of schooling. If you see what I mean. Sure. And uh, is there have you and uh, within that is there a specific sort of uh, concern you've got that you think that. Um, uh, Liz and Molly can answer on that. Uh, is, yeah, is, is your son at? Um, so he's at a secondary school. Yeah, he's just going. He, he's thirteen. He finishes when he's what sixteen, seventeen years yes. in school. I just don't know what's going to happen to him after. I mean, what's in this country for him after that? I don't understand. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, Liz, how would you how would you respond? Do you do you feel that there's enough focus on? Uh, those with, uh, you know, with 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 learning challenges, learning disabilities, no. for example, or autism. Or, or do you... about schools on the TV, it's normally about normal school children. Yeah, let's see what Liz says to that, Ros. Yeah, I think that unfortunately we've seen this consistently um, throughout the pandemic um, and before that children, you know, with with SEN are really sidelined, and the voices um, of of those children and families are not sufficiently amplified um yeah. you know we've seen terrible impacts from you know many children and families within our group um where the situation for those children has has worsened significantly yeah. and it really doesn't it, it doesn't reflect well on our society if we're not actually raising awareness i think is is one of the first things and then putting 
um, solutions in place um, to provide more support and hope, I think. I think that's what's really, you know, sad for me to hear what you say, is that you're not, you don't know what's going to happen and that's not a position we should be um, having for children um, in this country. You know, there has to be hope and there has to be... Um, it has to be vision. Ros, what would you, what would give you hope relative to where you are now? What does my age mean? They're not, yeah. I start watching BBC news and everything, right? I, I watch you all the time now because, Jesus Christ. Fantastic. Tick in the box, Ros. Tick in the box. <laughs> Honestly, I have because they do my head in, right? And I'm watching news and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, yeah, I have got something to say. You don't talk about special needs kids. I mean, my, I mean, he's on a, he's not in a wheelchair. But he's, he's got no sense of danger. I've got to feed him every day. I've got to wash him every day. I've got to clothe him every day. I've got to, do you know what I mean? Watch him up on that road. I've got to. So you, you want that sense of, of confidence and comfort that there's going to be help and that there's, uh, you know, there's some there's some hope out there for you, for your son, Roz? Well, I'm hoping. Yeah. Roz, um... Uh, I just want to know what these have got to say. But, I mean, I tried bringing in earlier about the Scottish Independence. Yeah, no, and sure, got, sure. Oh, um, well, I no. want to get on now. Yeah, all right, Ros, listen, we'll come back to that. Thank you very much, because we're going to go to a break in a second or two. Uh, it, I mean, it's a critical part, isn't it? You know, SEN departments within the schools. Uh, where do you think that is compared to international comparisons? I don't know the answer to that. It would be a very interesting thing to find out. What I do know the answer to is that we've had a SEND um, review that has been, I mean, crawling is an overstatement, crawling through Whitehall for years, decades even. Yeah. There was meant to be a white paper delivered. It was downgraded to a green paper. And I think it is, as Ros says, it is so depressing because it gives a very clear signal about the lack of priority given to these children. You know, there's that very famous Mandela quote isn't there the, the mark of society is how it treats its most vulnerable yes. members and in that we are yeah, yeah I, I dread to think what it says about our society I, indeed um give us a call 0344 499 1000 if you want to put a question to liz and molly we're going to take a break in a second because uh, this book the children's inquiry it's the last bit of it that i really focused on the way forward we can do better we must do better it's absolutely essential but it requires focus, it doesn't require government wa waffle, and it requires action. You're listening to Ty's Talk, it's Talk TV.
Welcome back to Ty's Talk. It is about 20 past 12 this afternoon. We've been talking all sorts today. We've been talking Scotland, negotiating the withdrawal agreement. We were talking earlier with Howard Cox. Lots of messages coming in uh, about Howard, climate sanity, sea level rise. It's all good. But the most important thing of all is, of course, our children, our future. And I've still got Liz Cole and Molly Kingsley in the studio who wrote this amazing book, The Children's Inquiry. Uh, questioning why children were sort of almost forgotten, almost like an afterthought in the whole COVID crisis. But this critical last chapter, uh, the way forward, you know, in a sense, making sure that far from being an afterthought, uh, they rise up to the top of the agenda. Uh, and we just touched on on Finland, uh, which is obviously, I mean, they're sort of you know, one of the shining examples. What do they get right that we're getting wrong? I think there's this sense in in, you know, in this country that what we call extracurricular is some kind of add-on. Um, and I think in Finland there's very much more focus, from what I understand, on a holistic um, and rounded education where, you know, things like music and sport are really you know, put at the centre of that experience. Um, you know that for me is one of the key differences my my preference would be that well-being is actually the metric that should be the overarching metric that the government should be looking at and everything else flows from that because what we measure we improve so so if i was jacob rees mogg and and clearly i'm not but he would probably say well that's always a bit, a bit sort of uh that's a bit waffly i, I want sort of clear exams and and lots of history and and mathematics He'd be wrong because actually it's there is so much data to show that if you have children that are happy, they actually do better at the academic stuff. I think the other thing going back to Finland and I'd actually widen it for the Nordic countries more generally um, is early years. We haven't really talked about early mm. years, but we get early. The way we do early years in this country is an insult. It's an insult to children and it's an insult to parents. It is failing. It doesn't work. And we are letting children down at the most important time of their lives. So this is pre-primary. This is pre-primary. Yeah. So 40 percent of the disadvantage gap and, you know, to remind listeners, watchers, what viewers, what that is, by the time children reach GCSEs, children from better off areas tend to do about 18, they're 18 months ahead, those from more disadvantaged areas. And that's the disadvantage gap, the attainment gap. 40% of that has emerged before a child even steps foot through a school door. Wow. So what the Nordic countries do so much better than us is they have early years systems that and it's not really education at that that age but it is more formal systems that allow children to play it nurtures them develops them and actually we haven't really talked about parents but it also enables those parents who want to be with kids more easily to do that um but has funded and subsidized places for children for whom you know the parent, it's better to be in and so, so that, 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 exactly so some parents may want to get back to work and and that critical funding um <coughs> fascinating then you talked about uh in a sense the uh the lack of responsibility within government for children that it's sort of uh, there's the, there's no there's no one at cabinet level who's i mean yeah. there's the education secretary but he or she's a pretty busy person yeah I mean, I think the, the lack of a, of a cabinet minister level role um, responsible for children speaks a lot about the priorities of the government and it doesn't, it doesn't reflect well. Um, so we would like to see, um, you know, at the very least the cabinet men minister for children and then the role of the children's commissioner um, to be significantly strengthened because what we saw throughout the pandemic was the children's commissioner did advocate very strongly but those voice, that voice didn't have sufficient bite and power. Uh, and this was absolutely vital because the commissioner sort of, in a sense, is a part of the Department of Education. It's not independent, doesn't have any legal standing. Is that right? It's No, it's not a fully... Well, it's an independent role, but it's not... It's not... It, it's linked to and importantly gets its funding from the Department for Education. So, you know, is it truly independent? So what would you like to see? A genuinely independent role. It shouldn't be in the same building. It should report to Parliament. Um, so the good example here is the Information Commissioner's um, office, which is right. independent. It reports to Parliament and it gets its funding, I believe, from Parliament, not from um, a ministry. Um, and it's also actually, and again, in some you asked about 
the, some Nordic countries, and I believe one of the things they do there is they have quasi, you know, your children's commissioner is a quasi judicial role. Right. Um, okay, so that's that's clearly uh, that's clearly very important, and the ICO is is actually very powerful. Yes, and that's what you know. The children's commissioner has very wide ranging data collection powers in this country and that's great and you know it's it's currently Dame Rachel D'Souza and she's just done this you know very impressive survey um huge survey of children and families but actually what can that person then do with it and the answer is very little because there's no enforcement power there's no yes. bite and really crucially one of the things we saw go wrong in the pandemic is the role doesn't have veto rights so you know take school closures which were this very obviously yes. very indiscriminate and harmful um you know piece of legislation and the children's commissioner is powerless to stop that and within within that infrastructure essential infrastructure bill the, the we would have liked to see the children's commissioner have that power of veto mm. to say actually you know, we, we don't want schools to close. So Chris has messaged in, and this is a good question. Uh, Hi, Richard. My wife's grandson has plenty of extracurricular activities. Because his parents can be bothered to arrange things, where's parental responsibility in all of this? And it's, it's a good question. A really fair question. So, of course, parents have a responsibility, but... You know, having, having living that at the moment, um, extracurricular, it's very patchy, actually. So even for those parents that want to, there are many areas in which you just don't have the option. And of course, parents also have a responsibility to put food in their children's mouths. And there is no avoiding the fact that many parents are struggling to do that. Yes. So, you know, much though we might let, like to get our kids to their art and drama and music classes, actually, if it's a choice between parents holding down a job or parents doing that, then often parents only have one choice. Yes, indeed. And I guess it's that if, if the focus is too much on just a sort of uh, never ending series of exams and tests, as opposed to the extracurricular, the sport, the music. And, uh, and I guess, Chris, many parents are good at arranging these, but the reality is many, many aren't. Yeah, and I think it's an outlet for many children, you know, that access to sport for a child who maybe isn't excelling academically um, is hugely powerful and transformative for a child. Equally, access to music or drama, the things that, you know, they allow them to showcase their talents um, and importantly build those social interactions as well. And, and your sort of conclusion in the way forward is, is, is pretty, I find it actually extraordinary, shocking, that children are a low priority, a low political priority in the UK compared to other, other nations. So finally, you'd like to set up uh, sort of s something to look at that. Well, I think we have to find ways to give children leverage because until there is leverage, we can have all these, you know, as many people as you want to talk about reform and what we need to do to, you know, recover what children has, have lost. But let's not pretend it's going to happen. It won't. Children need to be able to hold politicians' feet to the fire. Um, and and that, so that might involve a royal commission, but is there a danger that just takes too long and just kicks the can down the road? We keep it very narrow and focus specifically on this enfranchisement issue. So very targeted, um, focused on this one point. Got it, OK. And just finally, the, the public inquiry into COVID, is that now going to be expanded to, to, to cover uh, what happened with, with children in schools? Yes, it is, it is. but it will be useless for this generation yeah. of children. It's far, far too long and, and, a timetable. And, and sa yes, exactly, because sadly this inquiry mm. is going to go on for years and the only winners, yeah. I suspect, will be lawyers. Um, Liz Cole and Molly Kingsley, thank you so much for coming in. Fascinating. Really important to look at the way forward, not, about, not just uh, about the problems, what went wrong in the past. Keep those messages and calls coming in. You know the number. It's 0344 499 1000. You're listening to Ty's Talk. Coming up after the news... We're talking to Bob Seeley about problems in our strategic defence interests. It's Ty's Talk, it's Talk TV. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and this is Talk TV. I think my most memorable and proudest moment in journalism over all these years is actually being on air during the lockdowns, uh, even when I had COVID myself. Over the last two years, getting people to tell their stories, not just about people who lost loved ones to COVID, but people who lost their fundamental freedoms, their children's schooling, their mental health, their physical health, their businesses, and giving people the chance to tell their stories about how it affected them. is Talk TV News. 
Good afternoon. I'm Nadira Tudor. A cabinet minister has defended Boris Johnson, saying he wasn't aware of any specific allegations when he appointed Chris Pincher as the deputy chief whip. Mr Pincher was suspended as a Conservative MP on Friday following claims that he drunkenly groped two men at a private members club. Work and pension as uh, Minister Theresa Coffey rejected claims the Prime Minister was slow to act. I think the Prime Minister took very quick action, actually. Um, not only he was out of the country... Uh, in discussion with the chief whip when specific allegations had been made, uh, then uh, the whip uh, was removed. Um, in the meantime, uh, Chris had resigned as deputy chief whip uh, and uh, that uh, resignation had been accepted. Russia's defence minister has told President Putin that all of Ukraine's eastern Luhansk region has been liberated by pro-Russian forces. It follows conflicting claims surrounding the fate of the city of Lysyshansk. Ukraine denies claims that the city is already under their control. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister and Chancellor have promised the single biggest tax cut in a decade to help ease the cost of living crisis. Writing jointly in the Sun on Sunday, they outline a planning to spend billions to cushion the blow of inflation by also providing relief for council tax bills, fuel duty and energy costs. Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak say it could save every household £330 per year. And the Queen's workload is set to be reduced further, with events including the state opening of Parliament written out of her job description. The 96-year-old's mobility issues have recently forced her to pull out of several commitments. That's all for now. We'll have more in half an hour. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. I can't believe it. We're into the last half hour of the show. Time has just flown by. It has been absolutely full on. Uh, lots of tweets and messages coming in and calls and things. And we've just covered such a range of important issues. And uh, after me, of course, there will be the amazing, the wonderful Trisha Goddard from uh, 1 to 4 o'clock. And then, guess what? He's back. It's Kevin O'Sullivan from 4 till 7. And then Mark Saggers taking you through the evening. But uh, we've been talking children, we've been talking Scotland, but another critical element of our, our, our nation's national strategic interest is, of course, uh, defence issues and uh, the question about whether or not... W when companies are being bought and sold, which happens all the time, we also need, particularly when we're, in a sense, uh, we've got a war in Europe, uh, you know, we really need to understand the importance of uh, keeping uh, defence interests here in the UK, uh, keeping our technology and making sure we've got the skills uh, in order to uh, ensure that, you know, essentially uh, we've got the right technology for our, our military, our armed forces. And I've got an anxiety here because we've got a new Act of Parliament which has come in called the National Security and Investment Act, which enabled the government to put a stop on the sale of strategic shares and interests in really important businesses. Uh, and yet... Uh, just recently, a U.S. private equity group uh, has bid for and now has been approved by Kwasi Kwarteng, the business secretary, for the sale of a business called Ultra, worth over £2.5 billion, pounds, to an American private equity group called Advent that a couple of years ago bought another big U.K. defence business called Cobham. They promised that they wouldn't break it up and sell it, and guess what they did? They broke it up and sold it into many parts. And there's many other businesses that are on the business secretary's desk uh, that he's looking at. He has the power to stop the sale of these or to impose strict, strict conditions. I'm concerned that he's not using that power. I'm delighted to be joined by Bob Seeley, MP for the Isle of Wight and also a member of the Foreign Affairs uh, Select Committee. Uh, Bob, a very good afternoon. Thanks for uh, joining me. So, uh, you know, we're hugely, hugely dependent on uh, defence industries to support our military, the technology... And, and this has involved over, you know, not just the odd year here and there, but, but decades of experience and wisdom. I, I am concerned when uh, these businesses get sold overseas, uh, Bob, and, and, and that essentially the, the, the business secretary has got the power but seems to be allowing these sales time after time to go ahead. Um, good afternoon, Richard. Good afternoon to your listeners and viewers. I mean, I think there is... OK, there's a bunch of issues there um firstly there is 
you know, a level playing field with other free and open, reasonably open economies like that of the United States? Uh, would the Americans allow uh, a British investment fund to do the same to their defence conglomerates and businesses? Possibly not. At the same time, we probably have an interest in having a slightly more open economy than the United States because we are much more dependent on overseas foreign global investment. So there is a balance, but you could say we haven't quite got that balance right. There is also a series of red lines. You know, the Chinese have been buying up or companies that are then partly owned or wholly owned by China and the Chinese Communist Party or conglomerates associated with it have been um, buying up companies for the intellectual property and then effectively just taking that back to China. So, so, I think uh, that, yeah. that is a complete no-no. So there are a series of separate discussions about an open market and then about having neo-authoritarian states buy into your sensitive um, sensitive parts of your economy. I mean, you know, I'm a fan of free markets, but it has got to be subject to what I would call smart strategic regulation. And I'm, I'm glad you raised the point about China because... There's another file sitting on the business secretary's desk uh, for a company called Newport Wafer Fab, which yeah. is the UK's largest manufacturer, designer and manufacturer of semiconductors mm -hmm. and a, a subsidiary of a subsidiary of the Chinese state, essentially, has agreed and indeed contracted to buy that subject to the secretary of state's decision. He took many, many, many months to, to call it in. He has now called it in. But that's exactly your case in point. I mean, surely allowing that to go through, uh, you know, it's, I mean, semiconductors, half the semiconductors in the world come out of Taiwan. We're obviously concerned about Taiwan. Richard, for that, for me, the wafer, wafer pub is a complete no-no. I mean, it shouldn't be happening uh, and it should be blocked. The, the National Security and Investment Act clearly was an improvement. It's still more laissez-faire, for example, than Australia and the United States, who are a little bit out of step with our, with some of our allies. And in the American version, the Americans have more of an input from foreign, from their State Department, from their Foreign Office, and they have more input so, from the different. So that's a, a key thing. Our, yeah. What? What? And in our own, Richard, it's only the Secretary of State, the Bay's Secretary of State, that signs off. He obviously, he or she will take representations from other government departments, but you could say there's less of a security aspect in our version of the law than there is in Australia and America. So, so what's, what's the sort of double check? I mean, you're on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, and then there's obviously the Defence Select Committee, and the pair of those committees would would, I would hope, be having a very robust look at this and making strong representations one way or the other. Um, what, what sort of counterbalance do you have if, if the business secretary, for example, is just too laissez-faire? Well, the, I suppose the counterbalance will come from other government departments. And uh, ultimately, the, the Secretary of State can be overruled by Downing Street, but that's probably a big ask. You're right. Look, I, I think it makes us more vulnerable. And in the discussions around the National Security Investment Act, I wrote a definition of national security on behalf of the Foreign Affairs Committee to put to the government. Sadly, they didn't accept that. I think we need a definition, even a quite a flexible definition of what national security is. Uh, we argued that other ministers should um, have more of a say uh, when it comes to the sale of sensitive companies. The government didn't buy that, sadly, either. So th they are very much focused. And, you know, they're with some justification, there are very good reasons for this, in making sure that we have a more open economy to make our economy more attractive to overseas investment because of our increased dependency. Yeah, that's all the, well, down but I, I, the downside of that is that then it is easier possibly to sell companies in sensitive dual-use defence, you know, high-tech artificial but, Technology. Why should we have a more open economy than supposedly the sort of the, the global bastion of free trade, which is the United States? Why aren't we as smart as them in protecting mm -hmm. our national interests? Well, smart, you're, you're assuming that a, a slightly protected approach is smart. I'm not saying it's not because I think we, you know, let's put the let's get the arguments out there and discuss them. Um, I, I think okay. The, we are more dependent on overseas trade than the United States. And in some things, actually, the U.S. is pretty protectionist. So we, we think the U.S. is fr sometimes, frankly, much more free market than it is. Um, so we're trying to get a balance. I'm not sure we've quite got that balance right personally. 
I would like to see more of a role. I would have liked to see more of more of a role for defence or the agencies, secret agencies, in discussing some of this stuff. And I would like to see, you know, the Secretary of State make the decisions more in conjunction with others and having others to have a stronger statutory role. We should not be selling anything sensitive to China. And indeed, we're already way too dependent on Chinese trade, even in our... Exactly. Economy. Just, um, in whilst- the way Europe is much too dependent, has been much too dependent on Russian gas. Interesting. And we've problems that have been there. Um, just before we go, uh, Bob, I've just had a tweet in here. Apparently, Australia has a foreign investment review board to deal with foreign companies investing in Australia. I assume it works the other way, that looks yeah. at uh, those sort of purchases. Uh, the it question does. is, do you agree? That is that the sort of thing yeah, that yeah, we yeah. need? It, it, it does, and it's a, it's a very good point, and it's got character stuff in there. If you don't like the people buying it or you think they're quite dodgy... There you are. Um, and, it, and it is much broader, and we looked at the Australian model when we came up and worked with... In fact, I worked with a couple of very capable Australian lawyers in London looking at what we could learn from the Australians uh, in our definition of national security. Sadly, the government... Exactly. Indeed. It sounds like there's a lot more work to do, Bob, because uh, it doesn't feel that we've quite got the balance right that you refer to. Thank you so much for joining me here on Ty's Talk this morning. That was Bob Seeley, MP for the Isle of Wight, Conservative MP. Uh, he's concerned, I'm concerned. Give us your thoughts, your views. It's Ty's Talk, it's Talk TV. <laughs> Welcome back to Ty's Talk. We've got the last 15 minutes of the show before at one o'clock, of course, the amazing Trisha Goddard will be taking you through until four o'clock. Lots of tweets and messages coming in. One here from uh, Puff, who says, 
Uh, why aren't you updating your social media accounts? Uh, I'm apparently on fire today uh, and uh, wanted to share it, but apparently it's not on YouTube. I think it is on YouTube, and then uh, you should be able to look at it on the downloads later on. So uh, that was just to answer that. Uh, then uh, what have we got? Oh, message here. Children have lost more in COVID than they did during World War II. That's a really, really simple, uh, shocking statement, but is actually probably true, the impact. Uh, really, really significant. Anyway, uh, oh, another message here talking about uh, strategic interests, and this is a concern actually of mine about the impact of... Uh, what about the involvement of China in our research departments? For example, at some of our research uh, establishments, universities, links to them... Uh, for example, in uh, in Manchester. Very significant. Anyway, we're going to go to a couple of calls now before we finish. We're heading to, I think, Warrington, where Asunta is on the line. Hi, Asunta. Hiya. Hi. What's, uh, what's going on? What's on your mind this afternoon? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to say well done on Talk TV. You're allowing people to have a platform to say what they think. And I love it. I listen to you every day. Great. Second, what I like to say is about the Scottish independence. I say England should give Scotland the Scottish independence. Since 2016, this has been going on. And do you know what? Sturgeon, she will not let it go. She's like a dog with a bone. And once that bone, she's got an arm. Yes. She go until she's got it. But, but do you agree with me, Asunta, that there's a... You know, it's not just the impact in Scotland, but there's actually a significant impact Hello? on... Yeah, can you hear... There's a significant impact on the remaining 62 million citizens. I'm not sure if Asunta is still there. Are you still with us, Asunta? I'm, I'm, st I'm still... Ah, excellent. Yeah, do you hear my, my observation is, it's not just Scotland, it's the impact on the rest of us of them leaving. It is. It is. It is, but they don't get that. Sturgeon doesn't get that. I don't think she's done her homework properly. She hasn't thought about the NHS, she hasn't thought about the army, she hasn't thought about the pound, because no doubt she will want a pound, English pound. W the Scottish pound, it doesn't worth a penny. So would you... you abroad. Yeah, would you let her have the, the, uh, the British pound or not? Sorry? Would you let her... Would you let the uh, sturgeon have the British pound or not? Yeah, I think we may have we may have just missed you there. That's it. That's it. You've got me now again. Yeah. Uh, my final question there, Asunta, was: Would you let uh, the Scots have the British pound if they went independent? No. No. I there we are. I Asunta wouldn't. wouldn't let them have the pound. Thank you, Asunta, very much for your thoughts there. Uh, that was Asunta. I think it really is absolutely vital that we think about the remaining 62 million citizens in this debate. Let's head from Warrington to Cheshire, where Sandra is on the line. Hi, Sandra. Hi. Hi there. How are you feeling? What's on your mind? We've had a busy show. Yes. Um, can you tell me why there is nothing on the news about the progress of crypto, crypto um, currency, that all the countries are adopting it slowly but steadily, and we have nothing on the news? Um, well, that's a, a very good question. Are you talking about uh, the individual different cryptocurrencies or are you talking about the possibility of, of uh, nations, individual nations, setting up their own sort of central bank digital currency? They are doing it. That's right. So it's you're talking about the, the latter. They're actually doing it. Uh, that's, well, the, the, uh, some countries are. Uh, I think in the UK, as you clearly know, the Bank of England has got a department or a, a team that's looking at it. Um, are you happy with that? Are you overjoyed at that thought or are you no, terrified I'm by it? I'm not happy with it. They shouldn't be looking at it. They should be doing it. We've got, we've got um, the state with a silly court case about one of the cryptos that, you know, would be brilliant for um, the supply chain and everything. And, um, no, I, I so, think so, the silence is quite deafening. So, so, but just to be clear, you do not want a central bank digital currency, a sort of uh, government-owned cryptocurrency? No. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, actually. I'm very concerned about it, Sandra. I think it, uh, it feels a bit big brother, 
And I wonder if that's a way they're going to try and shut down other cryptos. But we will come back to that. I had a crypto expert on a few weeks back, Sandra. Keep listening. Yeah, I will get I've someone not else. Heard you. I've not heard yeah, you. Yeah, it was about four or five weeks ago. But I will come back to it, Sandra, because you're absolutely right. It is an important issue. And we do need to understand it. I'm going to try we and get... Don't want, we don't want the government, because the governments are the bankers. Well, and there's a war going on at the moment between the bankers. So. Well, I, I'm, I'm concerned, actually, the bankers are too close to parts of the government. But, Sandra, thank you very much for that uh, observation about central bank digital currencies. I'm not happy with the idea at all. It worries me. But let's see. Let's go to Jimmy in Birmingham. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, Richard. How are you doing? Fine, fine. What's on your mind? I've just got to quickly get through yeah, a couple I'll of calls. You, you know, your show today has been fantastic and you've spoken so brilliantly about this situation, <coughs> excuse me, please, uh, with Nicola Sturgeon and Thank the you. SNP. Um, I, I'd just like to say... Um, with the greatest of respect to the Scottish people and their country, which I love both of them, what the hell are they thinking about? You know, it's absolute madness. And like you said earlier in the show, supposing they get um, into trouble economically, severely, and they have to go pandering to the likes of Russia and China, what's that going to mean for the rest of Britain? That's the point. There's no debate, is there, Jimmy, about the impact on the rest of us, the risks? No. And also, I mean, there was a... <laughs> I don't know if you know, Richard, there was a massive Welsh independence rally yesterday in Wales. What, what, you know, what 50 again, people? Again, no disrespect to the lovely Welsh people and their country, yeah. because I love them too. Absolutely. But it's already been proven that Wales cannot go independent. They can't afford to. No. I'm with you. I, what, what, what I get... If they're concerned that Westminster's not doing a good job looking after some of their interests, I get the whole debate about wanting more powers to be devolved to uh, the respective nations, the devolved nations. But that's very different to complete independence, isn't it? It is. But also, I am on the side of more fairness for both of those countries, Scotland and Wales, and we need a new administration in Westminster. Oh, and not more bureaucrats, Jimmy. But... No, Jimmy, I've got to take one more call before I finish the show. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Keep listening, keep calling. I'm going to head from Birmingham way north up to Scotland where Alison is there. Help me, Alison. What's going on? Am I right <laughs> or wrong here? Um, oh, I don't. I don't think uh, Nicola Sturgeon actually has the standing because she said at the election that that was guaranteed that it was an independent one. You know that that it was just an election that it wasn't giving her a mandate. She wasn't going to use the mandate to go for the referendum. No, but now she's saying that if she's not granted a referendum, she'll use the next general election as an as its own referendum. I don't think... Uh, see, the problem is Labour and uh, Conservatives in Scotland are the Unionists for the Union, and that's... Uh, that's and her, her boats only split. Well, and and uh, if it come to... If, if we knew the election was going to be a referendum result, uh, a lot the Unionists would... Just Indeed. The one do you, party do you think, she doesn't need it. Do you think, Alison, finally, just before we finish, that uh, Sturgeon is using this to cover up her utter management failings in, in things like health and education? Oh, it's ridiculous. I mean, that four-year-old trans carry on with the children in the school, not telling the parents. The drug deaths in, Glas in Glasgow, I think a man's expected life is 54-year-old or 47 or something. It's really quite low. I mean, and this going on and on and on about a referendum is driving people crazy. It yeah. really affects their mental health. It, it is, Interesting. It's dangerous. Yeah, it's no, that's, and I'm, I'm not surprised. Dangerous. I'm not surprised. I mean, it's 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 so divisive. It's so debilitating. Oh, I can't stand listening to it anymore. Yeah, well, that, that's been 14 years. It's just, it's, oh, it's... It's almost as though she's trying to fatigue everybody into saying, oh, you know, be done with it, just, just... You know, take your independence, and uh, it's almost like she's trying to wear us down. But I think that it's so much more important than that. It's so risky for the other 62 million citizens, Alison. 
She's maybe trying to wear the, the English down yeah. in the other parts of the UK, but when it comes to the unionists in the Scotland, she'll it's, not wear them down. They just get angry. Get angry are they? And, and the, what they'll do is they'll just vote for the one party instead of voting uh, Tories that would vote Indeed. All. Alison, I've got to go because I've got to hand over to Tricia, but thank you very much, Alison, for your thoughts. And there is Tricia. She is with us uh, to take us through the next three hours. Hi, Tricia, how are you doing? Hello, how do you... <laughs> I just saw a hand dart in there. Um, it's interesting that your, your last caller mentioned mental health because, as you know, on a Sunday we look at mental health matters. We're actually going to be looking at students uh, starting university because there is a pretty much of a mental health crisis amongst students um, after COVID and going back uh, to school. And we know the onset of mental illness tends to be about that age when you start yes. uh, university. We'll be looking at that. Also, British Israeli. Uh, trade talks. We're actually looking at politics in Israel. Okay. Um, I like to introduce our listeners to different parts of the world and what's going on there. Last week, France, this time Israel. We have our faith panel, as usual, and lots, lots more. Fantastic. Well, we've been talking lots about uh, Scottish referendum, about the impact on the remaining 62 million citizens. That's mm -hmm. got people going. Central bank digital currency and the like. Well, Tricia, you have a fantastic, fantastic show for the next three hours. Don't go anywhere, everybody. And then after that, of course, we've got Kevin O'Sullivan uh, taking you through until uh, 7 o'clock from 4, and then it's Mark Saggers. Thank you for all of you for listening, for messaging. Uh, lots of compliments, uh, lots of criticisms. Apparently I'm a hypocrite, but there we go. Um, and lots of other...